So, um, thank you very much for being with us for the first time, first part of the session. And for the second half, we will call in Dr. J. Smith to join us. But Dr. J. Smith is almost on the line. Let me just call him. Hello. Okay, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Peace of Christ be with you, Jay. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. What have you been doing, Jay? How is what have life? I been doing? <laughs> By the way, you are live right now. Just be aware of it. Oh, okay. Well, there's nothing reason I can't. So what I say to you, what I say to everybody, I've been making videos. I've been also doing, uh, getting, uh, doing my lectures for my master's course that I'm teaching, and I'm also. So I just wrote this poem for Muhammad. You wrote poem for Muhammad. Yeah, but that's coming at the end, so I won't oh. do it at the beginning because you won't understand a word of it until you know, go through what we're talking about today. Okay, so, so also you've done something. Um, you're supposed to be doing something which you didn't do. That was simply send me your handouts until by yesterday. And your handouts came during the live stream. So I'm just trying to work them on and download them. So until I do that, um, it's going to take a little bit time. Apologizes for that. Um, Jay, why don't you introduce yourself and summarize for us um, the things you are doing? Yeah, in fact, maybe I could even introduce what you're pulling down so get to get people ready. I, I haven't been watching all your uh, live streams these, this week, so I'm not sure where people have gone or what their themes are. Uh, when you asked me to do to come with you tonight, you'd asked if I would do something on the historical critique, which is my area of expertise, which is where my love is and where I have been working since 1995, uh, the area that I've been working on. So what I'm going to do tonight is a little different, I'm sure, than everything else that others have gone before. Um, I'm going to be looking at whether or not even Muhammad existed. Back in 2011, I think it's 2011, uh, our good friend Robert Spencer, you've had him on, I've had him on, we're good friends. In fact, he's just rewriting this book, and I'm reading it as we speak, 2012. He wrote this book in 2012, Did Muhammad Exist?, and of course, at that time, people just laughed at him. They just scoffed him. He uh, he was seen as nothing more than a than an upshoot, probably someone who was a little off his rocker, and for on for very one reason, because no one's really asked this question. And this is the question I'm going to be asking tonight: Did Muhammad exist? But I'm going to be going much further than what Robert Spencer went. This is what he knew about back in 2012. I had Robert Spencer come on my show on Fander Films a few months ago, and at that time. I, I, we went through that book, we went through that material, and I wanted him to really unpack it for us. And I realized, my goodness, this, this is stuff that's powerful. It's good stuff. The only difficulty is that it's out of date. His book is quite a bit out of date. We've gone so quickly. We've gone so much further. And maybe this is this is a frustration we have, of those of us who are historians, but it's a good frustration. And that is as soon as we find something, as soon as we write it down, as soon as we put a video up or, or publish a book, immediately we're out of date. Because it's fast evolving. We're finding out an enormous amount of, of new research that's coming into play that has just been uncovered. Some of it has just been uncovered this year in 2020. And so what he's doing is he's writing that book again. Uh, I've just got the, the copy that came to me this week. Uh, it's He wants me to have it read by tomorrow, which is almost impossible. I can't, but I will certainly go with him. And what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to look for that quest. And that's why I named this The Quest looking for Muhammad in the seventh century. And we're going to unpack that, walk through it, and then I'm going to see what you think about it, Hatun. Throw questions at me, and I hope other people throw questions at me to see whether or not we can even find this guy, even see or even know whether he did exist, if he was the one that was there. Now, Hatun, which one did you are, are you putting up? Is this the one with animations, or is this the one without animations? Um, I think at this stage you are being very fussy, the one which downloaded first. And that is um, with animation. What? 
no, we, we, if you could do the other one, sorry. So, uh, we knew the one without animation because your uh, Skype won't accommodate. So, since we're not going to be running the an we're not going to be running the PowerPoint. We won't be able to see the animations. So if I'll just keep talking while you bring it up, we have plenty of time. There's no um, hurry. Before before you kind of do that part, um, just a practical question for um, individuals to understand. So there is a problem when it comes to um, Islam for his, historical account and traditional account. They do not go together. They do not complement one another or they do not fill one another when there is a space or when there is like needs to be information gather. Can you just summarize for us um, like how so far, how, um, how much like movement um, has been happening with historical side of Islam? What are the areas you have looked at beside Muhammad? <laughs> okay, I mean, this is exactly what we're going to go, be going through tonight, answering that summary, question. Yeah. In a summary, what we're we're finding is we can't find anything uh, named uh, any person named Muhammad that is anything like the Islamic traditions from the ninth and tenth century. These traditions that existed that only start to get put come into play uh, with Ibn Hisham al Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud. They are from the mid to late 9th century, uh, Al-Tabari and others in 10th century and on. Whereas Muhammad supposedly lived in the 7th century, these traditions all place him in a place called Mecca and Medina, those two cities that are in the Hejaz. And so we're looking for a man named Muhammad who comes from the Hejaz in the 7th century, and we just cannot find him. Now, there are a lot of references that people have put forward, and I'm going to go through the major ones tonight, uh, the suppositions that Muhammad did exist at this time and at that place. I'm going to go through each one. I'm going to debunk them tonight, show them that these are all frauds, and I'll show you why. And all I will do is just using historical criticism. I'm not sitting there and waiting to or wishing to try to impose some type of agenda on it. What I won't do and what I won't do is I won't take this 9th and 10th century overlay, this 9th and 10th century paradigm or model and try to understand what, what these things are saying, what the uh, the Astanami letters or the Doctrine Iacobi that we're going to introduce tonight. I'm not going to try to understand them that way. I'm just going to look them as they are. I'm going to read what they say, and then I'm going to unpack and see, is this the Muhammad that Islam tells us about? Is this the Muhammad that Islam has always foisted? Is this the Muhammad that uh, the only narrative we've been able or we are permitted to use because it's the only one that's taught? There is only one taught in all our schools, in our our universities, uh, even uh, that's the only one that is ever used in on uh, in our media, and because of that, it's 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 difficult for people, especially historians, and especially people like the numismatists. These are the ones I'm going to introduce tonight as well. The the experts on the coins. It's difficult for them to to even to even understand, to try to interpret what they're looking at, because they're so indoctrinated by this narrative. They're so indoctrinated by the Islamic traditions that they have no other way. They have no other guard, guide for which to look at it. So I'm going to go and I'm going to help them. And I'm going to help all those watching to try to look at a completely new narrative. And this will be the one that we introduce tonight. And now we're going to ask and try to answer, can we find this Islamic Muhammad, the Muhammad of faith, can we find him in the seventh century? And I'm going to show that he does not exist in the seventh century, but we think we know who he is. We think we know where he came from. We think we know what, what his name was. I'm even going to show you we think we know where Mecca came from. I'm going to show you that, and you're going to be surprised as to what we found. So all of that we're going to try to get in. How many hours are we doing? Um, like ideally, if you finish by two o'clock, that would be good. And what time is it there now? 11 o'clock. So three how, hours. Okay. How, many we'll hours try to get... how many hours do you need? If like, I could go for all night if you want me to, but I will try to hurry it up and try to get through it quicker than that. Okay, like I've got meeting at 2.30. So if you finish like before that, that would be helpful. But if you can't finish it, I can just postpone it. It's fine. No, I'll try. We'll get, I'm sure we'll get it in within three hours. That should be no problem. Okay, so um, I am ready. Um, I'll share the screen with you. Actually, no, I can't. Okay, I'm ready whenever you want to start. I'll move on the PowerPoints, and then you get to you get to see that. Okay, I can't see it on my screen. What am I? What, what, I don't know what slide I'm looking at. Okay, I'll be extra kind, and then I'll share my screen with you. Otherwise, I'm going to be 20 seconds late because I'm going to have to wait till it comes up on this screen here before I even know where we're at. 
So you should be seeing this screen now. I see it now. Yeah. Okay. So I will just tell you slide one, slide two, slide three. I'll just tell you which slide to move. So let's go ahead. And this is this, this is the quest. This is looking for Muhammad in the seventh century. The road less traveled. That comes from Robert Frost's, Frost's uh, poem that I'm going to introduce later on. And, and in sense, this is what this this is the ethos of what we're doing. We're going to the road less traveled. And this is October 2020. That's important because in a year from now, in 2021, I may have a completely new narrative. We may have an absolutely new set of paradigms and research that's come to place. So bear with me. What I'm telling you today only ex uh, is for 2020 and it's for the month of October. Next slide. Now, we're going to investigate, well, four areas, really, and then we're going to get some conclusions at the end. First of all, we're going to look at the problem, and I've kind of suggested what the problem is. I'm going to unpack that. I'm going to look at a timeline, and I'm going to show you why this is a perennial problem that everybody has. It's not just the Muslims. We have this problem as well, and I'm going to introduce that. Then I'm going to go into the book, The Man in the Place. Yeah, now, you've heard me say this phrase many times before, Hatun, so you know what I mean by that. And for those of you who have followed us, the book, of course, is the Quran. The man would be Muhammad. The place would be Mecca. So I'm going to be looking at the what the books are. I'm not going to spend too much time in the books because that's a whole nother uh, talk for another day for another time uh, and that would include all the kerats that Hatun's been working with that would include the, the Ahruf and the Razum that we're working with but I, I, I we need to bring that in there because there is also parts of the book that the that supposedly this man Muhammad received that we need to question but then we're going to look at him himself we're going to look at primarily at who Muhammad was where you know that that famous phrase they seek him here they seek him there they seek him everywhere that damn uh, elusive Pimpernel from the Scarlet Pimpernel. That's a great phrase. They can't find him everywhere they look. They just can't find this Pimpernel. Well, that's the problem we're having with Muhammad. Everywhere we look, we simply cannot find him. We've sought him everywhere, here, there, everywhere. That damn elusive Muhammad. So what we're going to do is we're going to look and ask why is it we can't find him? And I think we we think we know the answer now. And then of course we're going to since there's a man, we also have to look at the place. Did he live in two cities called Mecca and Medina? Uh, did those cities even exist at that time? Uh, were they anywhere like what the traditions tell us? And so we're going to find that this is not the case. Almost everything we're going to find tonight does not come from the Hejaz, does not come from Mecca and Medina, does not come from Central Arabia. It comes from much further north. And then I'm going to put it all together and come to some conclusions. And that's where then I hope there are questions. I hope there are people who throw things at me. Feel free to do so. Let's go to the next slide. What they claim. So let's look and see what they claim. Well, to begin with, they claim this. Number one, all Muslims would claim that Jews and the Christians corrupted their book and their God. <coughs> Therefore, number two, Muhammad was sent to correct those corruptions. I'm not saying the Quran says this. No, I'm saying Muslims say this. For, thirdly, they would say that this man, Muhammad, received this book between 610 and 632, that 22 year. Uh, there, for number four, that he lived in Mecca and then moved to Medina in 622. And that in number five, that the book that was given to him between those in those, that 22 year period, though it was not written down while he was living, that book is exactly the same that I have in my hand today, 1400 years later. It has not changed in 1400 years. And Mecca, where he was born, where he spent his life until 622, is still the center of the world and the center of history. So those are the six claims they make. Next slide. And here's the problem. Now, if we had this animated, I could go through and animate this for you and show as it jumps up. But it, since it's not animated, Skype doesn't accommodate that. Let's just look at this uh, timeline. There's Muhammad. He was born. And this is visual. This is why you need to see it in front of you. And I'm going to be giving you a number of these timelines throughout this talk. On the left there, you can see Muhammad was born in 570, according to the traditions. Okay, So this is the traditional account. This is not my account. I'm going to disprove everything you see in front of you today. So on the left there, Muhammad was born in 570. He re starts receiving the Quran in 610. There's, you can see the cursor, Hatun's bringing the cursor along. So that's when he starts receiving the Quran. Then in 621, he then suddenly gets woken up in the middle of the night, is told to get on, on the back of the winged horse called the Burak, he, who flies him down to Jerusalem, and he ascends the seven heavens, meets Allah, and then he comes back and forth between Allah and the fifth heaven where Moses is found, and he bounces back and forth between those two heavens to get the 50 prayers down to five prayers. Then in 622, 
he then moves from Mecca and moves up to Medina, and that's called the Hijrah, the Exodus. From 622 then to around 632, that 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 uh, that that next eight or the the next ten years, he is in Medina and he receives the Medinan revelations. In 630, he goes back to Mecca and conquers it without firing a shot. And then he dies in 632. Uh, some say by poisoning, we don't really know, but that's where he dies. Now that's in black is Muhammad's life. So that's all the black that you see there. That's important. And at the bottom you see the red. The red line, that's Muhammad's life, so you know what, what the time period is. Now, the difficulty is that he's not the only one that Islam is dependent on. They're also dependent on the four rightly guided caliphs. Uh, the first one is Abu Bakr. There he's in green, 632 to 634. Umar is next. Uh, he comes in between 634 and 644. He's killed. He had followed by... By Uthman. Now, I will say that while U Uth Abu Bakr was living in 632, 634, the first recension of the Quran, that's the first copy of a book called the Quran was written. A second one was compiled in 652 during the reign of Uthman. There you can see it there. I've got that. Political. That's important because we're going to get to that later on. And then he is killed in 656 and Ali, the adopted son of Muhammad, comes in. And he rules for five years. Finally, he is killed by Mu'awiyah, who then takes over in 661 and introduces the Umayyad Caliphate. And that's the Caliphate that it continues from 661 up until 749. So roughly a little over, a little over, not quite 100, 100 years. So that's the, there you see it in a nutshell. You see it on one graph, just to, so you understand what I'm talking about. Let's go to the next slide. But hold on. What about the sources? So everything I've just told you in that timeline, let's now go to the next slide, because the next slide I want to introduce to you, the next slide shows you another timeline, because everything I've just said in, in, about Muhammad, about where he was born, where he died, how he received revelations, where he, where he went up to the seven heavens, all these stories that surround his life, all these stories about his his wife, all the stories about his uh, relationship with the other, the Ansar and the Mahajurun and those people that live in Medina and the many different battles he had between 622 and 632, the last 10 years of his life. All these stories, where do they come from? And this is what Muslims aren't asking, and this is what we need to ask. Everything we know about Muhammad, everything we know about what he said, what he did, does not come from the time he was living. There you can see where Muhammad died, 632, on the very far left of the graph. We know that he died. So that's now taking up from the last slide where we saw the timeline. This is where it's we're putting his death now on the left. All right. We don't have anything written down about his life at during that period. Nothing exists during that period at all. There is no sirah. That means there's no biography. There's no hadith. There's no sayings that are in our hands today that we can look at from that time period. And Muslims know this. They're all aware of this. What they will tell us is that first time that anything was written down about Muhammad's life is the man named Ibn Ishaq, and he's written in green there. 765 is the day he died, or the year he died. That's the first guy to write it down. Now, you notice I don't have a blue line underneath him because we don't have Ibn Ishaq. We don't have anything from him. Nothing exists. We've only heard about him. Only what we have is what we call attributions. It is attributed to him. Why? Because the man who takes what he wrote, and then takes what he didn't like, throws it away, and retains only that which he wants to retain, is named Ibn Hisham. There he's over to the right. And he does have a blue line coming below him. That's Ibn Hisham. Ibn Hisham died in 833. So he dies about 70 years after Ibn Ishaq. He throws out much of Ibn Ishaq because it's just not good enough. It's And what does that mean? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it means it doesn't fit the narrative of the Abbasids. Notice where I put the Abbasids there. I put the Abbasids there for a purpose. You're going to see why later in this talk. They come into power in 749. And in really, everything we know about Islam today comes from them. Everything we know about Islam today comes from the Abbasids. So I'm going to keep reminding you when the Abbasids come to power. We do. Islam is not a Umayyad invention. It is an Abbasid invention. And notice how Ibn Ishaq comes almost 15 years after the Abbasids come to power. He writes his first biography. It looks like it's a first draft. It looks like it's what we call a white paper. It has lots of mistakes. It's not what the Abbasids really want. 
They've got the wrong man at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. That's why Ibn Hisham comes another 70 years later, or in this case, 85 years later, and he writes a completely new biography, a completely new biography. Oh, he gives, he attributes it to Ibn Ishaq. And Muslims today want you to say it's Ibn Ishaq's biography. Have you noticed how many people, even Westerners, say whenever they write, whenever they read this book here, this book here, Life of Muhammad, who's on the cover? The Siddha Rasul of Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq is the guy they have on the cover. This has nothing to do with Ibn Ishaq. And that's the lie that many, including Orientalists and many Western scholars, they all want you to believe that when you read this book, it's a huge book. Uh, I've had to use it. Hatun's had to use it. We've all had to use it. This is the book. This is the best book there is. But it is not written by Ibn Ishaq. It is written, written by Ibn Hisham. It comes from 833. It does not come from 7065. It does not come from the 8th century. It comes from the 9th century. Please, please, please get that, all right? That's hugely important for what I'm going to be talking about. So can you see there's an agenda going on already? There's an agenda going already between Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham. 70 years of agenda. Still, however, we have nothing about what Muhammad said. Isn't that odd? We have nothing written down about Muhammad said. All we have is what Muhammad did, and that's the Siddha tool. Did you want to say something, Hatun? No, I just showed the book. Which book do you have? I'm sorry, I didn't see it. I, 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 because I'm sharing the screen with you. Um, Ibn Isham, same book. Okay, so you're showing. So yeah. does it say Ibn Isham on it? No, Ibn Isak. It's the same Ibn book. Ibn Isak. Yeah. And this is one of the lies that Muslims are trying to, and I can understand why. They would like to put this biography up as close to Muhammad as they can. They would rather it be 765 because you're only talking about 130 years after Muhammad, not Ibn Hisham. Because now you're talking about over 200, you're talking about 201 years, over 200 years. There's the problem. It's not just that it's 200 years old. The real problem is... It comes after Abd al-Malik, and it certainly comes after Abd the Abbasids. So you've got the same book up that I've got that I just held up. But yours is really tattered, so you really abused yours. Excuse you must have been throwing it up against the wall because you got fed up with it, reading it, I imagine. Excuse me, Jay. Don't, I don't abuse things. Just a side note. Um, so even though um, it says Ibn, Ibn Isaac, so Ibn Hisham kind of does lots of editing, lots of editing to put it together. Um, so we do not have what exactly um, Ibn Isaac um, write it because even he says like, oh, I, I don't want to write everything so it will cause problem. So we don't know the original, but we know the edited version, edited version of 832, 833 edition. That's great. All we can say is what we have in our hands today is from 833. We don't know if any of that that Ibn Ishaq wrote is included in this book. Okay. There's no way of it's nothing more than what we call attribution. You you know what I mean by that? Hatu yeah. Hatu meaning they say they just attribute it to Ibn Ishaq. Yeah. Also remember, um, Jay, we don't even have the um, earliest manuscripts for those things. So that's just no. Like, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Because that's you, a whole nother discussion. Yeah. No, because you are talking about history, so we are co looking at history from the traditional books they are giving to us the only thing we can say at the moment and this is why we're having to repeat it over and over again in all our shows is these are nothing more than attributions even ibn hisham how do we know that this is from 833 even how do we know since we don't have any of the original manuscripts you're going to see this is a real problem when we get to al-buhari we don't have anything of al-buhari's until the 11th century yet he was writing in 870 the 9th century so Actually, it takes 150 to 200 years to finally get the first manuscript. And that's just one of the nine manuscripts. All nine manuscripts don't really come into existence until the 16th century. Okay, just a small comment on Bukhari since you mentioned it. Bukhari has been canonized in 1800s. If you like. There you go. We're, in fact, we're going to get to Bukhari. So why don't we go okay. right to You no, have no. Al-Wakiri. He's not really that important. He's very similar to uh, Ibn Isham. He's in green because he wrote the Siddha. And he, he dies. Some say he dies in, nine, in 833. Um, I'm sorry, 833. Some say 835. 
whatever it is, there's disputes as to what his real date. In other words, he lived almost about the same time as Ibn Hisham. He was not liked as much because he included a lot, an awful lot of the Maghazi documents. The Maghazi documents are the raids that Muhammad did, and that's why he's not as appreciated as much. But let's then go to al-Buhari, and that's now in blue. So I put it in three different colors, so you can see we're talking about three different genres. Actually, we're talking about four different genres. So the green are the Siddha, that would be the biography of Muhammad. They are the earliest. Throw Ibn Ishaq out. Now, if this was animated, he wouldn't even be on the screen anymore. I shoot him off the screen in my animation, my animated one. But for our purposes, Ibn Hisham is the first to write a biography. So uh, I wish I could just blot out Ibn Ishaq's name, but I can't. So the first one is 833, 200 years after Muhammad. Al-Buhari then introduces a whole new genre. So we're talking roughly, we're talking um, roughly 40 years later, you have a completely new genre, a much more, a much more prolific genre known as the Hadith. And these would be the sayings of Muhammad. And the Hadith are introduced by him. He was according to the traditions. Now, is this correct? Who knows? It's all attributed again. But what we're told, this is the story, that he was given 600,000 of these sayings, these akhbars. And he was to take, uh, the other name that's given to him is Matan, Matan, M-A-T-N. And he was then to look at each one of these 600,000, and he was to whittle them down, all the way down to, the from the from one to all the way to 600,000, and throw out that which he did like. So here's another censorship going on. This is a second censorship. This is similar to the censorship that Hisham had. His, Ibn Hisham had the same obligation to do the same thing to what, what he did with the Siddha, Abu al-Buhari now is given that same task. Throw out that which you don't like, throw out that which fits the narrative, the Abbasid narrative. This is now during the Abbasid period. This has nothing to do with the Umayyad period. And what's interesting, we're going to show you a map coming up. I'm going to show you a map where all these people lived. And you will see that these people did not live anywhere near Muhammad. They did not live anywhere down in the Hijaz. They did not live in Arabia. They lived hundreds of miles away and hundreds of years different. We're going to get to that, but let's just go with al-Buhari. So there you have al-Buhari there, 870. And he takes from the 600,000, he whittles them down to 7,397, or basically 7,400. So he whittles it down just to 2%. Throws out 98%. 98% that was fraudulent. Or was it fraudulent or just did it not just agree? It just did it not just agree with the Abbasid narrative. I would suggest it's the second. There is a censorship going on here, a mass scale censorship trying to whittle out anything that was Umayyad, anything that had to do with that which has come earlier. And that's why it took this long. It took 240 years to finally get this new narrative. So this is the new narrative that's introduced by al-Buhari. 98% of it is not what they want. They only want the 2% that he retained. Much of it is repetition of the 7,397, only 2,000, 100 and some and so are actually unique. So he's the first to write it down, and that's why he's known as Sahih. He's given that title, Sahih Buhari, because he is without error, Mo meaning that he is the kingpin of all the Hadith writers. After him comes Sahih Muslim. He dies in 875. After him comes Tamiri. He dies in 884. Then comes Ibn Majah. He dies in 887. Abu Daud dies in 899. And An-Nisa'i, he dies in 915. So from 870 up to 915, basically, you're talking about you're talking about 40 years. It takes 40 years for all these six. These are the six major ones. These are the six most authoritative. So these are the ones that are attributed to these characters up until the 10th century. But yet that's not the only genre. You have two more genres, and those are written in brown. The tafsir, which are the commentaries on the Quran, and the tahriq, which are the histories of mankind. And those are, yes, you're right, you, you're, you're circling them. Those are compiled by al-Tabari. 
he dies in 923. So he compiles them in the early part of the 10th century. Now, there are many that come after Al-Tabari, Zamakshari, Suyuti, Baidawi, all of them come after, but none come before Al-Tabari. So by this time, he is the one that's given this job. And what's interesting, Al-Tabari is a fascinating character because what he does, he puts everything there. He just puts it all down. Contradicting stories after contradicting stories. He doesn't really care. He just wants everybody to read it and then lets everybody go home and decide which one they want and throw away what they don't like. So he is a character because for his sake, he's not concerned with one narrative. And in some ways, he's very refreshing because that's not the case with the Hadith writers, and it's certainly not the case with Ibn Hisham. And so that's why Tabari, many people look at Tabari and they kind of joke about him that, you know, you can get every different opinion you want with Al-Tabari, and the big problem with it is which are you going to go with? Well, it's up to you, whatever one you want to go with. But for me, that's very refreshing. I love Al-Tabari, that he puts out so much material. So you can see where he contradicts Ibn al-Bukhari at times, he contradicts Ibn Hisham, he does stories that shouldn't be there, that are actually dangerous and injurious to Muhammad. And then he just puts it up there and says, now you choose which is the one you want. So he's a he's a fascinating character. But he's not the only ones that writes these tafsir, these commentary. He writes the histories, the tahrik. And that's why his tahrik uh, are the, the histories of all of mankind. So he's given the responsibility to compile these histories and compile these commentaries. And the commentaries are primarily on the Quran and the histories are of all mankind leading up to uh, the time of Muhammad himself. So those are the four genre of what we know as the Islamic traditions. Those are the four genre. The sirah, that's the biography, the hadith, the sayings, the tafsir, the commentaries, and the tahrik, the histories. But now take a look. Just look at that graph and look how late they are. I'm always putting up Abdul Malik's line there because you'll see when we get to the coins why Abdul Malik is so important. But Abdul Malik is becoming less important now that with this newest material that we're learning this year. The Abbasids are much more important, so I put him in the larger, more bold black because we need to start now changing our narrative historically to realize that much of what we're looking at is... Uh, Abbasid invention. Okay, since you're in such a hurry to get to the next slide, let's go to the next slide. Okay, and here's the problem of distance and direction. This is what I said I was going to show you. Um, take a look and let's just read what we're saying here. If you can. The Islamic traditions say everything happened in Mecca and Medina. That's the green area, the Hejaz. See those two green ones? You can see Mecca and Medina. That's way down south in Central Arabia. So that's where they say everything happened. That's where they say Muhammad was born. That's where they say that the, the, that he received the revelations. I see that your screen is covering over some of the some of the script. That's okay. I'll just read what they cannot see there. Yet all of the writers of the traditions, that includes the Sira, the Hadith, the Tafsir, and the Tahrik, dude, uh, of the, were lit, worked in uh, Baghdad. They all were living in Baghdad, which is too far north. Take a look at the map. You'll see. Look how far north Baghdad is. Ibn Isham, that's this guy of the Sira. That's the guy who wrote the biography. He uh, is from Basra. And you can see where Basra is. I don't know if you want to circle it. You can just show it on the map there. If you could circle it with your cursor. There's Basra in southern Iraq today, right there. That's where they've had all these battles in the last few years in the Iraqi war. Basra is where he was from. But he didn't grow up there. He actually grew up over in Cairo. Take a look where Cairo is, over on the left. So he, grew, he lived in Basra, grew up in Cairo. Basra is about 530 kilometers from Baghdad. Cairo is 1,700 kilometers from Baghdad. Now let's look at Buhari. Al-Buhari, who is the one that was is given the responsibility for the Hadith, he is from Buhara. Buhara is way up in Uzbekistan, way up north. That's where he grew up, Uzbekistan. Buhara is 2,400 kilometers away from Baghdad. So you can see these guys are not from Baghdad, and they certainly aren't from Medina, and they're certainly not from Mecca. They're way, way off, hundreds of miles away, or thousands of miles, thousands of kilometers away. Al-Tabri, Al-Tabri is from, uh, who wrote the Tafsir and the Tahrik, he is from Tabaristan. Tabaristan is what is in northern Iran today, near the Caspian Sea. 
Now, Tabaristan is about a thousand kilometers away from Baghdad. So these guys never, ever really lived in Medina. They never lived in Mecca. They never were down in the Hijaz. They were all way, way up to the north. And they did their work in Baghdad, which was the center of the Abbasid dynasty. So they were right there at the and the where everything was happening, where everything was taking place. They came from Buhara, they came from Tabaristan, they came from Basra, and they lived in Cairo, but they all worked in Baghdad. None of them worked in Mecca and Medina, where they should be, because that's supposedly where everything is taking place that they were writing about. So none of the traditional writers lived or worked in Mecca or Medina. They were too far to the north of Mecca and came from the west and east of Baghdad. Note, all of these northern areas are where the Abbasids originated from, and they're at the seat of a lot of the Abbasid learning. That's hugely important as well, as we're going to see. Let's go to the next slide. Now, what's my remit tonight? Well, listen, we really are no longer interested in the 9th and 10th century. 10th centuries. I've already given up the 9th and 10th centuries, okay? Let's just put that down. I'm going to say it from the get-go. Who cares about the 9th and 10th century? Don't waste my time. I tell this to people who call in all the time. Muslims are always trying to shut me down and say, but that's not what the traditions say. And I'm saying this tonight. I don't really care what the traditions say. I'm not interested in the traditions anymore. We're not interested in the 9th and 10th century. Why? Well, you can see from that last map, they're, too, they're all written too far away and too many years later. They're just too late and too far away to be trusted. The traditions were all constructed by the Abbasids post-749, and they definitely had an agenda. We are only interested in the 7th and 8th centuries. That's all I'm interested in tonight. I want to know who this Muhammad is from the 7th and 8th century. I want to go back to where it all began. And that's where we need to be. We need to go back to where it all began, where the traditions say it all began. Well, if they say it all began there, then why are we wasting our time up in Baghdad? What are we doing wasting our time in Cairo and in Basra and in Buhara and in Tabaristan? Who cares about those places? I'm fed up with those places. I want to go back to where this guy lived, and I want to go back to where he did his work. Okay, let's do that. Next slide. And the next slide is a poem. It's a poem by Robert Frost, a very famous poem. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both. Be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there, had warned them really about the same. Both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Those last three lines I put in, in bold because those last three lines is where I'm at at the moment. When I look at Islam, you have two different narratives. You can look at two roads in front of you. You can make a choice. The one on the right is worn. That means everybody has used that one. That one is well worn. It has always been used. And therefore, there's no weeds there. There's no grass there. It is just dirt. On the left... It's full of weeds. That road, no one has traveled. No one goes that way. No one has dared to. No one has needed to. We don't know where it goes to. It is something that since no one has gone, everybody has gone on the right. Well, I'm going to go on the left. I'm going to take the road less traveled. And you will see it'll make all the difference. Two roads diverge in a row in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. So let's go ahead and let's take the road less traveled by. Let's start with the book and let's start with the books. Since we need to do that, I wasn't going to do much on the book today, but I realize we need to. So let's go ahead and let's go to the next slide and let's see what they claim about the book. What is it their claim? Well, Muslims claim that the book, the book, the Quran has been well preserved. Number one, the Quran, they say, is uncreated, 
and exists eternally on clay tablets in heaven. That comes from the Quran itself in chapter 85, verse 22. Number two, the Quran was sent down to Muhammad between 610 and 632. They say, though not written down fully, uh, that we find in Al-Buhari, hadith number six, book number 61, had, um, hadith number 509. Number three, the Quran was completed by Uthman. That was the final Quran in 652. That's also from Al-Bahari, volume six, book number 61, hadith number 510. And the Quran is unchanged in the last 1400 years. That's in Surah 10, verse 15, and Surah 18, verse 27. What's more, number five, the Quran is guarded by Allah. That's in Surah 15, verse nine. And then number six, the Quran was finally canonized in 1924 and made official in 1985, so just 35 years ago. Those are the six claims they make about the Quran. And I, I listen, you could add more, you could subtract some. Those are the ones uh, that I've heard over and over again. I don't know if there's any Muslim that would dispute me on them. Maybe they would say the last canonization, 1924, number six, they would they probably uh, be reject. But listen, we're going to show you why. They have to say that. So we can't confront numbers one and two. I'm not here to really confront those two, but we certainly must confront numbers three, four, five, and six. So let's begin with how the Quran was canonized. Uh, next slide. And I, what I'm going to do here, Hatun, I'm going to look at Shadi Nasr. I want to look at his material. Now, all of this that I'm going to talk about is in a much bigger, it's in a two-hour compendium that I put up on October the 9th, this month, earlier this month. You can go up and see it on Fander Films. So everything I'm going to say here is in, introduced there. I'm just going to give you a, a bird's eye view uh, of just a quick encapsulation. We don't have the time to unpack it. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about this canonization. And, I, and I'm indebted to Dr. Shadi Nasser, slide number 13, Hatu, if you'll bring that up. Because Shadi Nasser has probably done the best work for us. And uh, if any of you have any chance, get his newest one. It just came out last week. I've got it now, and I'm looking through it. I'm going through it. We're going to do a whole new series of uh, of videos just on his most his latest work and his latest work is on the second canon so look at you see on the screen there there are set five canons these are five periods of canonicity that these are his choices so i'm going with him on this now he uses just the dates i use a name because i find it's easier to remember if you follow a name so the five names there are the five he would agree with those five names because those dates all have to do with those names but he just likes to use dates if you like dates, go with the dates. If you like names, come like me, go with the names. And the first name, of course, is Uthman. That's the first canon. So that's the Qureshi Codex. This was canonized in 652. That's the one that uh, chapters or volume six, Hadith number 509 and Hadith number 510 talk about. I'm sorry, Hadith number 509 does not talk about it. It's Hadith number 510 of volume six. So that's the first canon. The second canon is Ibn Mujahid. And that's the one, the book that he just came out last week is on. That's focused on this one, the second canon. Uh, Ibn Mujahid died in 936, and he is the one that that chooses seven readings. Only seven readings. That's all his attributed to him, these seven readings. This has been a big misnomer. Many people think that he chose the, uh, the 21. No, he did not choose 21. He only chose seven, the seven major readings. And Hatun, you have all these readings. I've only got... I've only got about three of, of those seven major readings, and I've got about uh, six of the others. No, I've got more. I've got seven of the others. So here you have Mujahid, dies in 936, and he's, these readings were all created between 736 and, 950, and 905. So they were all created before he was living, and obviously, otherwise, he could have chosen them. But he is not the one that chose the other 14 transmitters or uh Get it, get, 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 uh, um, riots. The riots, the transmitters, the students, the those were chosen by Al Shatabi. Al Shatabi died in 1194, and he. The reason he did that is just because there were so many of them. There was as many as possibly as 700 of them. It became so uh, uh, so difficult and so outlandish and so confusing that he wrote a poem, Shatabiya, and it's called, named after him, after his name. And in that poem, he just attributed two readers or two transmitters for each of the seven readers. So that's what he did. So he was the one that attributed two transmitters for each of the seven readers. So now we're up to 21. So by 1194, we now have 21 of these kira'ats or these ahrus. 
Then a guy named Al Jazari, who is probably the most famous of all of these. He's the one that is but from then. The reason why he is so famous is because he then added another three readers and another six transmitters or riwayats for these qiraats, these readers. And that's now, if you add three plus six, you now have nine. So 21 by the time of al Shatabi in 1194, it's now 30 by the time of 1429 of al-Jazari. And al-Jazari is the one that attributes the whole, the canonical text, the ones, the 30 authoritative texts that are even used today. These are the 30 that were then finalized in 1429. Take a look at the date there. Look at that date. That's the 15th century. So that's 800 years after Muhammad, they get the 30 readings and riwayats, the readings and transmissions. Hafs, however, was then chosen in 1924 by Muhammad ibn al husseini al-Haddad there at Al-Azhar University in Cairo. That was in 1924. So because there were so many, because these 30 were so confusing, and because all the tests there in the high schools there in Cairo were giving different, different, uh, they were giving certainly different uh, responses, they needed to bring it down to one so they could standardize all the tests. And so he does that in 1924. That was then made official for Egypt in 1936, and then was made official for the whole world in 1985 by King Fahd, and that's known as the King Fahd edition. So there are the five canons, one, two, three, four, five, Uthman, Ibn Mujahid, al Shatabi, Al-Jazari, and Hafs. Next slide. And we're going to start with Uthman. So let's go to the next slide and let's go with the uh, first canons. Let's unpack it a little bit. Can I just make a quick comment? Um, yeah. It seems that you are in the view of Ahruf and Krat, the same thing. Um, I disagree with that also like just there is in-house discussions like no one knows what his ahruf is you've got krat and then you've got rivayats so uh, you've got a teacher and that teacher's quran is identified as the krat and the student's qurans identified as the rivayats so hafs is a rivayat out of 30 something quran we're going to get to that yeah okay hold on to that hold on to that we're going to we're going to discuss that Okay, the first one is Uthman, and the problem with Uthman is this. When and when you look at that paper on the right, when you look at the, that's the reference in uh, Al-Sahih al-Buhari, volume six, hadith number 509, I think this, yeah, 509. This is the first, this is even before Uthman. This is the first one that precedes one. And Shadi Nasser does not take into consideration this one, because you could put a sixth one, you could say this is actually number one. I would have put this one as number one, and I would have called it the Abu Bakr one. But he doesn't. He he prefers to go with the Uthman, and I think the reason why is because there's so many so many Muslims today that are embarrassed by this. There's there's a huge embarrassment. Why is it you have a first one that was not used for the second one? Why didn't they just keep the same one? Well, because there was a real problem with the first one, and you can see because what it says there very clearly that there was an awful lot of men who died in battle at yeah, Battle of Yamama who had memorized the Quran. This caused a crisis, and Hatu, you've talked about this many times. This caused a crisis there in Medina. And there, while because of this crisis, Abu Bakr and Umar pull in and they ask Zaid ibn Tabit, who is the secretary of Muhammad, to come in and write the Quran quickly so that all, if all those who had memorized the Quran died, they wouldn't lose the Quran, proving that memorization is not good enough, suggesting very clearly that it's obvious that you cannot depend on memorization. Otherwise, why would you even have to write it down? So he does so. At first, though, he declines. He doesn't want to do so. He says, no, how can I do something that the prophet didn't even do? But they keep insisting, and so finally he, he relents, and then he decides to write it down. And so he writes it down there in between 632, 634, gives it to Abu Bakr, who then gives it to Umar, who then gives it to his daughter, Hafsa, who used to be one of the wives of Muhammad. And she, according to some traditions, I can't say that this is true, but according to some traditions, she then puts it under her bed and leaves it there for 20 years. Now, that brings all kinds of problems up because that suggests to me that uh, it was not that important to begin with because why would you put it under a bed and leave it for 20 years if it's the only written text, the only written codex, the only written copy of the Quran anywhere in the world? That in and of itself is problematic. So she does that. She leaves it there. Let's go to the next slide because then in the next slide, something even more difficult happens. Because 20 years later, now we're in 652, now we're in Sahih Buhari, volume 6, hadith number 5, 10. Now you have a much bigger problem. Another battle happens, much like the first battle, but this battle is way up in Azerbaijan. 
And this battle is, uh, uh, the, Uthman is now in power, power. He is the third caliph. He sends a pile of his men, including a guy named Hudayfa, to go up and help out the other Muslims from Syria in Iraq fight against the Azerbaijanis, which they do. They're fighting together. On Friday, they go to the mosque. And there in the mosque, they hear the recitation of the Quran in a completely different form. And the those from Medina start fighting. They start going. They start punching up the guys from Damascus and from Kufa and from Basra, because they think that these are completely different Qurans. Which then forces Hudayfa, who is in charge of these men from Medina, to return quickly back down to Medina. And of course, he's quite upset. He comes back down to Medina. He goes to Uthman. In his on his throne, he says, "We've got to do something. We must not have, and must not do what the Christians and Jews have done, who have many different Bibles. We must not have many different Qurans. Therefore, we must put the Quran into one dialect, and this dialect is the Qureshi dialect. We must standardize this in one dialect. The Qureshi dialect, according to Islam today, according to Muslims, is the dialect that was spoken in the Hejaz, that central part where Mecca and Medina existed." So they do that. He does that. He brings Zaid ibn Thabit again, tells him to get that copy that's sitting under the bed, under Hafsa's bed, to bring it out from her, to look at it. And then he gives three others to help him, Alas, Zubair, and Harith. Now, who are these three? Alas, Zubair, and Harith. Do you know who they are, Hatun? They're all Uthman's um, son-in-laws. They're his son-in-laws. <laughs> None of these guys have any scholarship. They have never written anything of note that we know of. They were they were nothing more than part of the family. So essentially what you have here is nepotism. This is a, a, a classic form of Uthman trying to keep it in the family. He just wants these three guys to have an eye on what Zaid ibn Thabit's doing to make sure that they get the credit and no one else. These guys are nothing. But nonetheless, Zaid ibn Thabit, who was a secretary of Muhammad, according to the traditions again, I'm just giving you the traditional account, does what he is told to do, hands, therefore, one, the final copy, the Quraysh Quran, to Uthman. And what does Uthman do next? He takes all the other copies from Iraq and from Syria, that means from Basra, from Kufa, which is just southwest of Baghdad, and also from Damascus, and he burns them, he destroys them, he wants nothing more to do with them. But he doesn't just do that, he does even more than that. Let's go to the, let's go to the next slide. In the next slide, you're gonna see what he does. Now, I wish this was animated. This is such a good animation I, that I put into this. But uh, when you have a chance, Hatun, you need to look at the animated form and just watch the animation because you can just follow the animation and it ha these things go flying in and out of the, of the map. Because what you're looking at here, you're looking at three red circles and two green circles. But before that, let's look at and read what we see on the left. To begin with, there is one Quran, right? And that's the Quran that was given to Muhammad. So that's the first Quran, and it's the Quran that existed when Muhammad died. Now, if this was animated, that's all you'd see on the page. So that was the first Quran. But according to Muslims and according to the traditions, Muhammad hears and he realizes that an awful lot of people who are there in, uh, in uh, Mecca and Medina, they could not understand the Qureshi dialect because that's what he received it in. That's his dialect. That's the dialect that must be in heaven. So he goes to Jibril and he asks him if he could have six more, six more dialects, which Jibril complies. And he allows him to have six more. So now there are seven different dialects, seven different readings. This is what most Muslims call is Ahruf Hatun. These are the seven readings that existed at the time of Muhammad. So these Ahruf were always there at the, before Muhammad died. That's what most people say the Ahruf is. What have you heard? Uh, yeah, so you don't use the word reading for the Ahruf. Ahruf. No, because nothing's written. No, like the readings they call the readings Krat. That's what they are calling them. But um, so these seven Ahrufs comes to Muhammad because Muhammad goes to beg Gabriel um, and then say, oh, my people cannot understand. They are poor um, when it comes to the knowledge. It will help them, and then Gabriel gives it to uh, Muhammad in seven different ways, seven different ahruf. But when you look at the Islamic tradition, Muhammad doesn't even mention this to anyone until 
Umar and Hisham have a fight with one another. Then every, um, Muhammad says okay to Hisham and Umar regarding the differences they have in Surah 25. And that's not enough. Still, people are not aware that Muhammad had this begging conversation with Gabriel, asking him to give Quran in different uh, ahruf. Uh, we, we get to hear the account of Ubay bin Kaab, where M um, Muhammad strikes Ubay bin Kaab from his chest when Muhammad confirms, yes, Quran has been revealing to me in seven different um, ways, seven different ahruf. Okay, now if you're to ask any Muslim, Hatun, if you're going to ask any Muslim, what are those seven ahruf? Allah what are knows they? best. What? To, give us the name of them. No, uh, we can't give the name of them because uh, there are like ideas, ahrufs might be the crowd, that, but um, overall academics is saying actually no, we don't know what his ahruf is. They're not the dialects, like they're not the... And yet Muslims do give you an answer for this. So be prepared for this. Be prepared for this. Muslims do give you an answer when you ask them. So what? where are these ahruf that you're talking about? Where are these seven readings? And they usually point to these right here. Can you see these? I've got them right here on my, on my, on my, uh, next to me. I don't know if my, the yeah, camera can go I, down there. I, so the point I was trying to make is ahruf and the crowd. So reading is for the crowd. That's what they use that term for. That's, oh, that's another exactly. Qur'an, or even Rivayat. But Ahruf is something was at the time of Muhammad and no one knows. So okay. even and now this is Muslims why... are confronting so... one another that they shouldn't be using the word Ahruf when it comes to uh, those different Arabic Qur'ans. Because most Muslims think these are the Ahruf, these seven, the first seven, the ones that you see here. Now, Hatun, you have them in, in your library as well. Yeah. And that includes Nafi, Ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, Ibn Amir, Asim, Hamza, and al Kisai. Those are the seven. And they always point to them. You see here, Ibn Amir, Ibn Kathir, al Kisai. They just point to them. Boom, 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 boom. Nafi and also uh, uh, Hamza. But you need to stop them when they say that and do what Hatun has just done. No, 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 no. These are not Ahru. These are readings. These are printed texts. There was no printed text at the time of Uthman. There was nothing at the time of Uthman. This is nothing more than, again, attribution. I'm going to keep bringing this word up. They attribute these to Muhammad when he was living. But these didn't exist. The reason why, look at the dates. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. So hold on to that, because when you look at the dates, you will see that these are over 100 years later. But now let's stop. Before you go that, I don't want you to go down yet. Before you do that, can stay on that, that slide, because what I want you to do now is I want you to just take a look at those red circles. Okay, just be aware my eyesight is not that good. Yes? Okay, okay. Well, you're doing very well tonight, Hatun. So far, you've got everything correct. Okay, I know so, you're wearing dark glasses. Yeah, and, so and far, it's dark I'm, in the, I'm, not, I'm not even seeing like if people are leaving anything on chat because it, like screen is so big for me. That's fine. So, yes, red circles. Okay, those red circles, there's three of them. On the far, the one at the very top is the one from Ubay ibn Ka. After Umar, after Uthman does this, he then sends out five readings to five different cities. And those are the five cities I've got circled there. Now, in the animation, I do this very quickly so you can see what's going on. The cities are Yathrib, which is down uh, right in the middle. And below that is Mecca. So those are the two green ones. Those are the two green ones down there. He sends it to Yathrib and to Mecca below it. Then he so sends another one to Basra, over here on the right. Kufa in the middle. And Damascus up on the left. So Yathrib, Mecca, Basra, Kufa, and Damascus. Why does he do that? According to the traditions, he does that so that every one of those cities has only the Qureshi dialect, only the Qureshi dialect. Remember, he burned all the others. So he's burned those from Basra and from Kufa and from Damascus, which means that by 652, there were no other dialects. There were no other dialects. They have been destroyed. 
And if they found they found any of them, they were to destroy them. And that's why he destroyed them to begin with. These continue to get destroyed. However, according to the traditions, other manuscripts suddenly appear. We have the one that known as the one from Ubay ibn Kab up in Damascus. That has 116 surahs. We have another one that appears in Kufa, which is right near Baghdad. And that's by Ibn Masud. It has 111. Some say 112. They can't even decide on what's it. But this is not 114. So obviously the one from Uba ibn Kab in Damascus and the one from Ibn Masud is, comp is different from the one that we have today. So these are really disturbing. And then another one appears in Basra that is written by Ibn Musa. So here you have three metropolitan codices in three different cities, two in Iraq and one in Syria, of the very places that are, have corrupted the, the Quran. The very thing that Uthman tried to eradicate and to try to unify and standardize came undone by the, before, before that century even finished. So suddenly you're getting more Qurans that are now being introduced, or they could be the very same ones that Hudayfa heard when he was up there at the Battle of Azerbaijan. What we do know is that by the end of the 7th century, there was not just one Quran anymore. Other Qurans were starting to appear. And they were even more authoritative. Even Masuz was much more authoritative than Uba, than certainly Zaid ibn Thabits. And Uba ibn Kaab brags about the fact, or it was, sorry, Ibn Masud brags about the fact that when, when he had already 70 of the surahs, good old Zaid ibn Thabit was just a little boy playing with his toys. So it's obvious that there was competition going on there outside of Mecca and Medina. So Uthman's standardization, canonization, as Shadi Nasser says, that canonization that happened in 652 was not really that effective because of the fact that all these other manuscripts still appeared and still continued to be used and still existed. But they all existed in the north. Huge import. None of those manuscripts are in the south. None of them are from the Hejaz. That's why I have them in red distinct from the ones in the South. So you color code it. The only one that's in the South that still was retained is Zaid ibn Thabits, which is in green. So from one Quran, it goes to seven, and then back to one Qureshi Quran again, but sent to five cities. Now let's go to the next slide. Now we can come to canon number two. Go to the next slide. So here you have canon number two, and we can go a little faster because this is a lot of these people, you've already heard this, so this is not nothing new to you. Here you have then suddenly in the 8th century, something happens. In the 8th century, these Kira'ats start to appear. And the first one to appear is Ibn Amir from Damascus. That's this one right here, Ibn Amir. Here, I've got Ibn Amir. And I just got this in October, Hutton, long after you got yours. So I've just now received these, and you can get these on the internet. These are easily, you can buy them. This is Ibn Amir's. Look at his date, 736. So this is not the Ahruf because this is a text. So this is not just a this is not just a, uh, uh, a dialect reading that, that your dialect with your lips in your mouth. This is actually a written text. It has dots. It has also dama, the kasra, and the fata. It has five dots and three vowels in it all the way through, page after page after page. This is the Arabic. Quran. This is the first of all of the Kira'at. This is the first reading. This introduced is this is written down at 736. Muhammad died in 632. Look at the look at the graph that I have up there. Can you see how many years we're talking between Muhammad? That's 104 years later that the very first one comes into existence. Next comes Ibn Kathir. Look up a little higher. And he is from Mecca, so his would be Qureshi. Remember, Ibn Amir would not be Qureshi, it would be Damascus. So he is from Damascus. So the very first one is from the corrupted area. The second one is from Mecca. His name is Ibn Kathir. Not, don't get him confused with the, 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 the Tafsir guy. That he comes much, much later in about the 11th century. This is the Ibn Kathir of the Qira'at, and he dies in 738. After him then comes Asim Ibn Abi al-Najud in Kufa. He's down and he dies in 745. So he's still in the 8th century. After, but he's now in Kufa. Next comes Abu Amr ibn al-Allah. He dies in Basra, again, in Iraq. Third down from the top. Look at his dates, 770. 
770. We're getting to the end of the 8th century. After him comes Hamza al-Zalyat in Kufa, back to Kufa again. His date is 772. So they can see we're now long after Muhammad, long after Ibn Amir. And then after that, we get Nafi, Nafi al-Madina. Medina means he's from Medina. He dies in 785. He's right at the top of the list. Nafi at the very top. His would be Qureshi, along with Ibn Kathir. And then finally, the last one is Al-Qasai. Al-Qasai that I have right here. Here's Al-Qasai. Al-Qasai is from Kufa again, along with Hamza, along with Asim. Three of them from Kufa, one from Basra, one from Damascus, one from Mecca, and one from Medina. So of the seven that you see there that were chosen by Ibn Mujahid, look and see when Ibn Mujahid chose them way over in 936. That is the 10th century. That's 200 years after the very first one is introduced. That's 200 years after Ibn Amir was introduced. Can you then see why Muslims don't want you to put this on a timeline? I, you need to see this timeline to see how devastating and how damaging this does to Islam. So when Muslims say that these are the seven that Muhammad knew, no, they are not. These are Qira'at. These are not Ahru. This has nothing to do with Muhammad. These are long after Muhammad, a hundred years after Muhammad. They didn't even live at the time Muhammad was living. None of them were even born uh, when Muhammad was still living. He died in 632. They only start writing their material in the 8th century. Some of them were born in the 7th century, but they weren't, they weren't writing when they were children. They were writing as adults, and the first one to write them down would be Ibn Amir. He dies in 736, a good hundred years after Muhammad's death. And they continued to introduce these Gerat, these seven, up until 805, up until the ninth century. And they were then chosen by Ibn Mujahid. So those are the creme de la creme, the best of the best of Yasser Qadi keeps talking about. He keeps talking about these seven. And he confuses it himself. He calls them the Ahruf. No, they are not. This has nothing to do with those seven that were introduced by Jibril back while Muhammad was living. Let's go to the next slide and then the next slide after that. Because then we get to the third canonization. So let's just jump to the next slide and then the next slide. Yeah, there you go. Now let's go to this slide. Here now is stage three. This is canon, canon, canon stage three. And I see that I've still got an awful lot of... I see that I've still got an awful, and I can't change it here. There's writing over a top. I didn't separate the writing. So by the, by the, let me just put it on mine so I know what I'm talking about, because mine is also, has, has interlays over top of each other. By, by 1388, there were 20, 21. Can you see it? I can okay. I'm just getting down here so I can see it on my computer here because I can. No, I didn't I realize that I had the, changed this for you. Look at the screen. I changed it. Gotcha. So by now, can you change that? That's that should be 1388. That should be 11. That should be 1194. That should be 1194. So if you could just correct that. By 1194. You have another guy that comes into play, and he's al Shatabi. Now, I've got his the dates right over on the right. It's just I didn't put it in there. So al Shatabi comes in 1194. He then introduces the next, the next, uh, the next 14. He is one that introduces the 14 Rawait. And so that's not till the end of the 12th century. Those are in purple there. You can see them in purple. Those are each one of those are the transmitters or the Rawaiats. These are the students. Interestingly, the reason they were chosen had nothing to do with textual criticism. Not one of them did anybody look at the text, compare it with even their stable masters. So when you look at look at the very top, when you look at Kalun and Warsh, would they, were Kalun and Warsh chosen because they were very similar to Nafi al Madina Madani? No, no. They were not chosen. The reason they were chosen, well, Kalun was chosen because he had many more students after him. So therefore, he was chosen for popularity. Warsh was chosen, though he did not have many students after him. The reason Warsh was chosen is because he comes from Cairo and didn't come from Medina. 
they wanted somebody from Cairo because they hadn't had anybody from Cairo. And Aldani liked uh, Warish, and he was the other one that was uh, choosing around the same time as Al Shatabi. In fact, he chose his his uh, he chose a whole different list than what Al Shatabi did, and he chose his about a century earlier. Fascinating. The reason those fourteen were chosen were because they were the most popular. They were the ones that had the most students who then were retained. Not one of them was chosen because of textual accuracy. That's what you do with textual criticism. You choose somebody because his text is closest to the original, or in this case, closest to the reader. So you choose a student, you choose a transmitter. That's what you do with textual criticism because it's the closest to the earliest or the closest to the original. In this case, they didn't do that once. Everything was chosen because of popularity or for the city they came from. Okay, let's continue on. Oh, just before you do that, can you see Hafs there? I've circled Hafs in black. Hafs was one of the Riwayats. You're right, Hatu. He was not one of the readers. He was one of the Riwayats. And look at when he was chosen. He was 164 years after Muhammad, a good 144 years after Uthman. I keep and put the Abbasids there because can you see all this was happening during or uh, during the Abbasid era or just beginning before the Abbasid era? Let's go to the fourth canon. This is stage four, canon number four, and this is the Al Jazari. Now, Al Jazari comes in in 1429 and he chooses the red ones the ones that are in red so you can see them Abu Jafar from Medina Yaqub al-Yamani from Basra and Khalaf from Kufa those are the three he chooses and then he chooses two for each of them uh, Isa ibn Wardan and Ibn Mud Ibn Jumaz uh, for Abu Jafar, and then Ruiz and Rao for Yaqub, and then also Isak and Idris for Khalaf. So there you can see he chose these in 1429. That's the 15th century. So these were chosen. This fourth canon was chosen by al Jazari 800 years after Muhammad. 800 years. So now by 1429, we have all 30. And these are the 30 that are now seen as authoritative today. And these are the 30 that called Muhammad, caused Muhammad hijab such a crisis. These are the 30 that caused him a crisis when we held them up there, uh, 26 of them up there at uh, Speaker's Corner in 2016. We just hold up 26 of them that you had collected, Hatun, caused him a crisis of, of faith. And he had to ask Yasser Qadi, which of these? Uh, he put his hand out. If I put you a blank piece of paper, which of these? He didn't say 30, but we knew what he was talking about. Which of these is this? Uh, Nafi. Would this be Ibn Kathir? Is it Abu Amir? Is it Al Ibn Amir? Is it Asim? Is it Hamza? Is it Kasai? Al Bazi? Al Duri? Hisham? Shabai? Khalaf? I thought you could go on and on and on. Up to 30 different names. He was asking, which name? Which one do I put in there? And it took him 25 minutes finally for finally our good friend Al Yasir Qadi to say, they are all the Quran. All of them. Take a little bit of here, a little bit of there. You mix them around and you get the Quran. That's basically what he was saying. And I remember when I first saw that, I just started clapping. I realized, do you see how idiotic this is? This is the only answer they have. They, they cannot say which is the one because they cannot even say that Huffs is the one because Huffs is not even one of the seven or of the 10. He is nothing more than one of the 20. And what's fascinating, he doesn't even come from Mecca or Medina. We'll get to that. Let's come and turn you on down. Okay, now we get to the fifth one, and this is Muhammad ibn Ali al-Haddad, uh, Husayni al-Haddad. This is the last one. This is the one that, the, that was chosen by Muhammad ibn al-Husayni under the authority of the educational authority there in Cairo. They had a dilemma. They needed to solve it. They went to Muhammad ibn Ali al-Husayni al-Haddad said, can you please choose one? We cannot have 30. We're getting such, so many different answers. We're getting so many so many different students who have different references. For that reason, can you please just give us one? And he was the one that chose Huffs. Now, why did he chose Huffs? Did he open it up? Did he look at it? Did he compare it with Asim's? Did he look at Asim ibn Abi al-Najud from Kufa, the same city? Remember, he lived with Asim. He was he lived in the same home as Asim. Asim was his teacher. And yet he still didn't write the same thing that Asim wrote. That's why he had to be chosen as a different one. That's why his became a different one. So that's the question you need to ask her about Mahim and Ali al-Husayni al-Haddad. Why did he choose Hafs? Do you know the reason, Hatun? 
um, because Turkish em Ottoman Empire was conquering lots of lands and Hafs was used by Ottoman Empire, so it was practically easier and it was favored, um, more popular among the like because like Ottoman Empire had a very big land, so it was uh, popular in um, different part of the world. Like most people would be more familiar with that. Because when we Absolutely. conquer, when you conquer, uh, you also introduce your culture, you introduce your book, and then you introduce the Quran you are reading. So it's like exactly. oh, it was all because it had, uh, but also just side information. In that stage, there are um, five dif official five different half Quran is also like another half Quran is used by um, in Afghanistan current Afghanistan, but they didn't went with that. They went with Ottomans' house. So fascinating. Now, they chose, he chose it because, now people have come back to me and says, no, that uh, the Ottomans were not in power in Cairo. The British were in power. This has nothing to do with political power. It has to do with religious power. But Who was the Ottoman? the Ottoman empire like, that had been in Iran for, for hundreds of years? Yeah. So, they, like, like um, 1453 is when the Ottoman Empire kind of start becoming bigger, 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 and then fall started beginning of 900s. So by that stage, we were in Avusturia, like not we, but like Ottoman Empire were in Avusturia. Like it, it was like very big empire. So people learned that uh, Quran for like centuries and centuries. If even though you uh, move out from the land, still you leave behind the book and the all the customs you shared with them together. Okay. Now, why did the Ottomans choose us? Allah knows best. It's, it was because there was uh, probably something to do with Mehmet. No, it has to do with geography again. Because he was from Kufa. That was the closest to Turkey. They liked him the best because he was close to them. Now, remember... Isn't that the reason that Uthman burned all of those those Qurans because they were too far away? Sorry, what is the reference so the, for that, Jay? This is coming from Gabriel said Reynolds. That's what he's giving why Ottomans choose the half Quran. There's nothing written down, but what Gabriel read Reynolds says it looks like they chose him because of the fact that he was from Kufa and because that was so close to Turkey. No, because like Ottoman Empire didn't start Anyway, th yeah, that's fine. Okay. Fascinating enough, isn't that the same location that Uthman found were corrupted? Isn't that the the very place that that the that he had burned? <laughs> the very thing that he had burned. It looks like when it comes to the Ottomans and certainly to to Muhammad ibn al Husseini al Haddad, the choice he made was was completely in contradiction to the first of what we know as the first canon. Let's cut on down then, and let's to the next slide. Now we need to get to orientation. Let's back up to the ninth century. And this is what I'm getting at. Remember when Hudaifa goes up to Azerbaijan and he hears these other Qurans and he comes back incensed and he tells Uthman to put it into the Qureshi dialect. Let's go to the next slide. So that, remember this slide, we went through all this. So here is the here is the iron and here is the lie that Muslims are don't don't want you to know. These were the corrupted Qurans, right? Because the corrupted Qurans were all in the north. That's where the red ones are. Those are the corrupted Qurans in Kufa, Basra, and Damascus. If that is the case, then why is it that uh, Muhammad ibn Hali Husseini didn't choose the ones from Mecca and Medina, the ones in green? Look at the next slide. When you look at the 30, let's look at the next slide, which goes and show, shows up all the 30. When you look at the 30 that were chosen, the 30 that became official by 1429, when you look at them, the only ones that were from Mecca Medina, the only ones that Qureshi are those in yellow. So that includes Nafi, that includes Kalun, that includes also Ibn Kathir and Al-Bazi and Kunbul, that includes also Abu Jafar, and it also includes Issa Ibn Wardan and Ibn Jamas, which means it only includes eight of them. It only includes eight of them. Eight of the 30 are from this place that, that should have been chosen. But that's not where Hafs is. Hafs who's circled in black. He's not from the Qureshi dialect. 
And that's the irony. And that's why most people are not looking at this. They need to answer this. I've yet to see a Muslim respond to this. The very Quran, the Quraysh Quran, the reason why this is was chosen is because this is the Quran that's in heaven. This is the Quran that Muhammad received. This is the dialect, supposedly, that is the heavenly dialect. Then why in the world did they choose somebody who didn't speak any of that dialect, didn't even come from that area, came from hundreds of miles away, way up north? But more than that, as we're, as I'm, we're not going to do it this time, but when you look at Hafs, you can see that Hafs was the worst of them. Let's go to the next slide. The four that were the four that were that were that, that those represent the ones in the ones that were outside the yellow. All the ones that were not in yellow are those from or for those four cities: Basra, Kufa, Damascus, and Cairo. They all come from those four cities. All of them are up north. Hold on to that. None of them are from the south. None of them are from the Hejaz. So one from Cairo, three from Damascus, twelve from Kufa, twelve from Kufa. Why so many from Kufa? You'll see why as we move on. Six from Basra and. Go ahead. Um, just a quick practical question. Um, Damascus is much closer to Ottoman Empire, not Kufa. Oh, as to why they chose Kufa? Yeah, like I, I'm just like I'm not sure if the it's it, the it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit together. But anyway. I don't know, and I can't say. That's just what I'm, I'm quoting from what they said. So what I'm going, what I would suggest is the reason why Kufa is because look at how many, and you'll see later, almost all of the tafsir are coming out of Kufa. Almost all of the theological discussions that you find in the tafsir are all being written in Kufa. Yeah, but and the reason why Kufa is because of Hira and also because of Baghdad, but mostly because of Hira. That's where the Christians had their seminaries, and that's where the Jews had their seminaries, and many of the discussions were in that that milieu. So it stands to reason that the number of Qurans that were now being, the Kira'ats that were being introduced and be chosen were from that same area. But it is very normal if it is the, already a heart of education, it's already a heart of schools, it is very normal, so you do have... Um, you you will have like more writings in that like if you think about it uh, like the play someone who lives in oxford will have access to more libraries than someone who lives i don't know york or somewhere like where there is not not like you or someone who lives in a village so like yeah. it, therefore it wouldn't be surprising to having the teachers and students with the many students with their versions. Okay, different... stop and ask that question one more, but understand what era are we talking about now? We're talking about the Abbasid era. Yeah, so, but like by that time already, if you look in a map, like it's already like lots of part of the Arabia, uh, the other side of Turkey, where do you, what do you call that? Asia part of the world. And Africa, North Africa, is already been conquered. Even Spain is already been taken. Like that's, I see that as like very, very. It would be very lo normal because like there is nothing like beside Mecca. So you've got only this small place. Versus heart of education is here, and then you've got okay. big libraries in here. But okay, any, anyway, hold I'll, on to I'll, that I'll thought. Listen. Sorry, I didn't want to cut in. I'll, I'll, I'm just listening. Sorry, Jane. Hold on to that thought, Hatun, and we're going to come back to that because once you're going to see, I've not even got into my material yet for tonight. Once you see when I start introducing the material for tonight, bring let's bring that question back again. And why then are is the North so important? But let's let's continue on because if you're just going to look at Kidat, then you can say yes, the Kidat are introduced in the the eighth the, the eighth ninth and tenth century. Therefore, at that time, everybody was up north. But why were they up north, and what was the agenda going on? Hold on to that because I'm going to show I'm going to show you that there was no re, there was no possibility that it could be from Mecca Medina, but I can't say that until I introduce my material to support that. Okay. Yeah. Go to the next slide. Oh wait, we go back to that last slide and just look at let's just look at those conclusions. So the minority of the Qurans originated in Mecca and Medina, while the majority were too far to the north. All of these northern areas except Cairo are where the Abbasids originated from. All right, now you're starting to get, you can see I have an agenda here, but you can see why as we move on throughout the night. Let's go to number 31. Conclusions. Shadi Nasr's five stages of canonization are a good model to use when ascertaining the Quranic canon. Canon 1, Uthman 652 high canon, is located too far south, and the real manuscripts were all further north. Notice the manuscripts are all further north. Canon 2, 
Ibn Mujahid, we haven't got into that tonight because I haven't had time. Ibn Mujahid's 30, 90, 936 AD canon of seven is made up of two in the Hijaz and five up north. Canon number three, al shatabis canon of 14, is made up of three in the Hijaz and 11 up north. al Jazidis canon of nine is made up of three in the Hijaz and six up north. Canon number five al, um, um, by Ibn Haluzaini al-Haddad's canon of one is singularly up north. Thus, of the 30 official Kid'at Qurans in use today, only eight are from the Hijaz, the 22 are from the north. These areas up north were all in the areas of the Abbasids, where they resided and they ruled. Are we beginning to see a pattern here? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to answer your question, Hatun, but let's continue on. So let's go then to the next one. And this is what about the Quranic Arabic? So let's go and to the next slide. Quranic Arabic, is it from the Hijaz? Now, according to the, all the traditions, the traditional narrative tells us that it is derived from the Qurayshi dialect, from the Hijaz. And that's in Al-Buhari, volume 661, Hadith number 510. This is the dialect used by Muhammad. This is the dialect, therefore, that's in heaven. This is the dialect that, therefore, Uthman wanted to canonize. This is also the dialect employed by Uthman that was sent to the five cities. Okay, so there you see the Hijaz is that green area that I have there on the map. Go to the next slide. Now, does Quranic Arabic, is it from the southern Levant? Or is it from the Hijaz? Where does it actually come from? Note what we are finding, and this is coming out of Mark Dury's book, and it's already coming from Al Jalad. Al Jalad wrote his book in 2018. Mark Dury wrote his also, I think, in 2018. Al Jalad wrote his in 2017. Uh, Dury's book has been out for two years. And what he says, the evidence points away from Mecca to the southern Levant. The southern Levant is that red area that I see that you have at the top. That's up over in Jordan. What is today Syria? What is today the Sinai and parts of Syria? Okay, that's much, much further north. So this evidence points away from Mecca to the southern Levant. In other words, is the, this is the dialect in which the continental skeleton or Razm of the Quran was recorded. In each case, the Razm accords with what we know of the southern Levantine Arabic. There are four areas, he says, in Quranic Arabic, all word final unstressed inflectional vowels, which have been influenced by the southern Levant Arabic, suggesting that the Quran was derived from there. What, are the, what does he mean by unstressed inflectional vowel, word final. That means at the end of the word, those vowels at the end of the word have inflectional vowels. Those are inflectional vowels that are different than what existed in the Hijaz. These inflectional vowels did not exist that far south. They all only existed in the red area, not in the green area, but the red area. Let's go look at them and let's unpack each one one by one. So let's go to the next slide. So here's the Irab. Irab short final vowels. Dury says this, in the Quranic script, unstressed inflectional short vowels are marked with diacritics, the dots. They are not represented in the Razm. These endings are known as Irab because they were characteristic of Bedouin uh, Arab dialects. Now, although, and he says, although classical pre-Quranic Arabic poetry incorporated Irab endings in its rhyme schemes, the Quran does not. The irrelevance of case endings to Quranic rhyme schemes suggest that they had been lost. Where was this dialect native location? Where did it come from? The Southern Levant is a possible location, he says. That's the red area, much, much further north. Let's go to the next, the next slide. And for, this is a little bit technical. I'm sorry for people who don't understand Arabic. But in Arabic, you have what we call the Tar Marbuta. Uh, the, in, in, uh, according to Dori, in Nabati in Arabic, the feminine ending, the At, which is the always, that's how you know it's feminine. It's always as the At. That's the Tar Marbuta, had changed to A. This seems to have been a regional feature in the southern Levant. Ancient northern Arabic, Arabian desert inscriptions do not show this change. They retain the at. This is restored in the non pausal position to at in the standard recitation of the Quran. So today's Quran, if you look at all the Qurans, they have the at there. By the addition of this superimposed dots to give the tar marbuta, that's what it's called today, indicating that the letter ha is to be pronounced as ta or at. In this respect, the dialect in which the Quran was composed appears to have taken what was a feature of Southern Levantine Arabic, where the sound change was first initiated and established it in Nabataean Arabic. Therefore, it follows that Nabataean Arabic or Aramaic, you might say. Therefore, it was uh, it was introduced at much, much further north. Let's go to the next slide. And the next slide then goes into what we know as the Aleph Maksura. 
The Aleph Maksuri, it looks like a, uh, like, a, like a figure S at the end of the word. I don't know if you can see it there. I haven't seen it come up yet. The Aleph Maksuri is the use in classical Arabic for uh, the final, the word final dotless Ya, the word Ya in, in Arabic. It is another form of the final Aleph or Aleph and is used beca uh, because an Aleph cannot occur at the end of the word. It's not you. You may not use an aleph at the end of the word. So the aleph maksuro was not pronounced as a ah when the Quran was originally being recited. Al Jalad in 2017 on page 153 of his book proposes that the aleph maksuro goes back to the earlier ay and is reflected in the Greco Arabic of the Southern Levant. That had to have been borrowed from the Southern Levant, which is much further north. Here again, the evidence shows that the pronunciation of Quranic Arabic at the time of its initial composition aligns with the Arabic of the Southern Levant and not from the Hijaz. Go to the next slide. And this is the fourth one. The definite article, Al. Our final piece of evidence concerns the assimilation of the definite article Al, the in English, to follow uh, uh, coronal consonants. The lack of assimilation in the Razm agrees with the evidence of Greco-Arabian and Nabataean, Safaic, and Hismaic scripts, all of which are in the north. The Arabic of the Quran was not a Meccan dialect, but instead conformed to the features of the Southern Levantine dialects. The Southern Levantine is the red area, way up in the north, up where Petra is. Note, in every one of these four similarities, they are all derived from the Southern Levant which is over 600 miles too far north to be native to the Hijaz area. See the map above. This completely confronts the traditional Islamic account, which claims the Quran is uniquely from the Hijaz. Now, here's one of the ironies. Let's go to the next slide. I don't know if I can bring it in here, but I, I need to say this. Okay, let, let's, let's, in fact, go back to that map again, the, first, the one before that. So what was the Arabic that existed there in um in, in the south. Do you know what the Arabic was? In the south, it's still forming. It's actually Safaic Arabic, which is fascinating because the Safaic Arabic, the what they did use in the Hijaz, comes from the Hadramat, which is way down in Yemen. Now, here's the irony. Had the Quran been written in that script, had it been written in that script, that script already had dots and vowels in it, which means if they had written it in that script with the dots and vowels in place, you would not have had the problem with the Kira'at or the Ahruf that we have today. Because it was already known. You could read it easily in the 7th century. The fact that they did not have these dots and vowels because it was derived from the uh, what we know as the Nabataean Aramaic, which is from the southern Levant way up north, they only had 16 letters in the 7th century. And that's why they had to introduce these dots, these five dots, and the three vowels, the Dhamma, the Kasar, and the Fata, which then created such a hegemony of many different categories, many different variations on where you put those dots and vowels, that you had all of these kirat, you had all these derivations that start to appear suddenly in 736 all the way up until 905, and then had to be reduced down to 30 by 15, uh, by 14, uh, sorry, uh, 1429 or 15th century. Can, one of the ironies of history, had they used the right Arabic to begin with, had the Quran been written in Safiq Arabic, which is from the South, which is from Mecca, there would have never been this problem with all these skinats, with all these different readings, with all these different derivations. And there would have been just one Quran. <laughs> this is one of the great, so you might say, one of the great ironies of history. But because of the fact that they decided to, and only because of the fact the Quran was created much further north, they didn't have this type of Arabic. They were only dependent on Nabataean Aramaic, which did not have dots and vowels, only had 16 letters, had these, these what they call consonantal or uh, end, uh, similar, uh, the, these, the endings like the Tarmat Bota and, and the Aleph Maksura and the Aleph. These all only existed in that Aramaic rendition, which was then chosen for the Quran, making it almost, almost impossible to read. 
and therefore having, having forcing them to invent the five dots and the three vowels, which brought about all the problems with the Kedats and the Akruf that we're now talking about today. One of the ironies of history. Let's go on. Now, I don't want to get into Huff so much. Let's go through this next area because we don't, I think we've already covered this. So let's move on down. We don't really have to go into that because I'm going to say that this is the wrong guy. We should never have chosen. Just put that last, just put that last slide up there just before this one. Let's just conclude what we do know. He wasn't trustworthy. Therefore, he was not suitable. He wasn't chosen for textual veracity or authenticity, but for political reasons. He came from the wrong city. He came from the wrong dialect. He should have been the last person among the 32 have been chosen. They got the wrong guy. They should never have chosen him. Okay. So now we get to Muhammad himself. Now we get to the, the juicy material. This is the stuff that's new. This is stuff I'm going to introduce to you now that so far um, no one has really talked about. I wanted to get through that, get it out of the way so we can get to this. What about the man? What about Muhammad himself? What are we going to do with him? Next slide. Muslims claim this, that he was the last or is the last and the greatest of all the prophets. They claim also that the Quran was his revelation, sent down only to him, and is the final and greatest revelation. And then number three, therefore, Islam is the final religion based on Muhammad's life and sayings, which is the Sunnah and the Quran's teaching. Now, next slide. What that tells me, therefore, is that everything Islam is dependent on is one book and one man. I've said this many times. You've heard me. This is nothing new. So we have already investigated the Quran historically. Now it's time to do the same with Muhammad. Let's now zero in on Muhammad and let's see what we know about this guy. Remember, we're not going to the traditions. We don't care about the traditions. And let's go to his letters because this is something that Muslims always keep coming out. We know he existed because he sent out letters to many different people. We have some of those letters. And the first one is the next slide is the Astanami. The Astanami is the one that's the most popular. You've probably heard about it. Have you heard about it, Hatun? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. I did a video just on the Astanami on April 22nd of this year. You can go up and see it. I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to uh, unpack it nearly as extensively as I did in that video. So let's just go and do a summary of what that video is. And let's go ahead and look at it. And you can see a picture of it in the next slide. That is it on the right. That's the Astanami. This is a, a letter supposedly written by Ali, the, son, the adopted son of Muhammad, written by in, uh, from Muhammad by Ali to monks who were in St. Catherine's Monastery, promising them protection and other privileges. Now, again, it's attributed to Ali, given to those monks, sealed with the imprint representing Muhammad's hand. Not the gold one, that's the black one, okay, just so you get it right. The gold one was put on a later date. So that hand that you see there, that left hand, is supposedly Muhammad's hand. Ahmed El Waqil's uh, uh, pivotal uh, research in 2017 quoted that the copy of the covenant with the monks of Mount Sinai also claims to be an exact replica, Nakl al Asl, and uh, an unadulterated copy, Naklan Musadakan, of the original covenant, which was handed over to Sultan Selim I uh, between 1487 and 1510. So take a look and see. The earliest copy that we have, that, that copy that you're looking at, is the only supposedly original copy, but it was only introduced, really, that as far as we can see, in between 1487 and 1510. Hold on a minute. Look at the dates. Do you see a problem, Hatun? Too late? Absolutely too late. <laughs> like almost a thousand years too late, about 900 years too late. Let's go to the next slide. And this is the problem. If you look at it, you will see the contents of it are great. They're amazing contents. Christians can gather anywhere. Okay. Muslims will protect their buildings. Yeah. So it's just a practical question. I'm just so curious because the same thing happened in the top couple of Musaf as well. So apparently that's hand of Muhammad on the on the writing. OK. I'm sorry, explain what you're asking. So you, you like, they attribute things to people and then say, oh, this is the hand of Muhammad, or oh, this is the writing of Uthman, all those kind of things. And then the date you get is like 15th century. So probably, I'm assuming, they kept the hand of Muhammad frozen for like 900 years. 
<laughs> and I'll put it put it on that. <laughs> it's like it looks kind of decrepit, doesn't it? It looks like it's a little bit deflated. It looks like it's a little almost fossilized. Okay, let's go with that. <laughs> Okay, so there's Hatun solution. This is the decrepit old hand. By that time, there would be no flesh on it, and there would be only bones. But no, nonetheless, no. I was just making the point, like when Muslim says, "Oh, this is attributed to this person because he, we've got a hand or we've got the writing," they are simply lying. It's the same thing in the top cup of Musaf. Like they say, "Oh, this has been, um, it was been read while um, Utman." So this blood is Uthman's blood, but like that only dating of that is like a couple of decades after Uthman. Hatun, have you have you ever been to the Topkapi Museum or Topkapi Top Library? Uh, yes. Okay. Did you see in the same... I've never been there, but my, my all my friends have been there. And they tell me that in the same room where the Topkapi... Or right next... Sorry, right next to the room where the Topkapi is housed. They don't show it except during Ramadan. But ne the room next to it, it, they have not only a imprint of Muhammad's yeah, feet yeah, in yeah, stone. Yeah, yeah, they've got lots of things. Lo lots of things. They have one of his teeth. They have part of his beard. Um, I, like, I can't remember a lot all full things because I didn't go there as a like, um, Christian. I went there like as a Muslim, and then it's just like, yeah, it's, like it's it wasn't that big deal for me. But yes, I am aware oh. that you've got like. Muhammad thinks while Allah knows best, how can they be Muhammad's? But it, yeah. And also, if you go up online right now, you can actually Google it. Go up online and oh, go to the Top Copy Library. They will show you a picture of Moses' staff, the staff of Moses, and the arm of John the, of John the Baptist. His arm, not his arm, but it's encased in, his, in a piece of metal. And you can see bits and pieces where the bones looking through where they've opened it up. So here they have the arm of John the Baptist. They have the staff of Moses from 1400 BC, right alongside an imprint of Muhammad's footprint that looks like a massive foot and his tooth and his beard. And that's the same type of forensic testing that they did on that as they have done with the Topkapi. The Topkapi is nothing more than attribute. You notice I'm using this word attribution all the time tonight? Yeah. yeah. It's nothing more than attribution. But let's go. Let's go. Let, let's look at the document anyways. It talks about the fact that no one can plunder Christians or destroy their churches or take anything from them thin. It says that a Christian woman must give her consent before she marries a Muslim man. It says that Christian women married to Muslim men are free to go to their churches. That Christians can build and repair churches and convents. And that Christians cannot participate in the military. So that's the essence of what it's saying. Next slide. I've got 10 problems. Let's go with all 10 of them. First and foremost, the date for the document given is 625. So while Muhammad was there in Medina, according to the tradition, Muhammad sent the, uh, no letters at all until 628. And they were, on, they were only to Medina, certainly not outside the Hijaz. So this, uh, this actually, this Ashtanami letter contradicts the traditions. There's no reference anywhere that he sent any letter to anybody outside of Medina. Ibn Sa'd in 845 gives us a list of Muhammad's 47 writings, but the Ashtanami is not included. If you look at the picture, go back to the picture, you'll see a minaret pictured on the right. Do you see the minaret there on the right, on the bottom? Um, it is like my eyesight is not good, Jay. It's... Okay, for the others, they can see it. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, Yahatun, I know you're wearing dark glasses because of Sunday. But I, I'm, believe me, I'm, there is a minaret there. It's pictured there just above the golden hand. So let's go back to the next slide. So here's the problem. Minarets, first of all, the first known minaret that ever existed is not to the 9th century during the Abbasid Caliphate and were not widely used until the 11th century. So how could there have been a minaret in the 7th century? It is called Miracle, Jay. Or they added at a later date, just like they added the hand at a later date. It uses the term Sultan. The first to ever use this term was Mahmud Mahmadov Ghazna in 998 to 1030. That's 350 years too late. No one knew this word even existed in 625. Mahmud Ghazi. Mahmud, say it again? Mahmud Ghazi. Oh, okay. I completely... I've, okay. Okay. 
That's fine. Separate Mahmud and of. I've got two words put that, together there. That's fine. I would say Mahmudov. <laughs> Mahmud of Ghazi. It employs Christian, Egyptian, and medieval Arabic, which were not used by any Arabs in the Hejaz that early. Again, much like the argument we saw earlier. Let's go to the next slide where you get the next the next five problems that we can look at. Problem number six. It refers to plundering and repairing churches, forced marriages, and non-participation in the military, which are all later Dimi rules introduced centuries after the fact. These did not exist in the 7th century, so it's way too late. These would not have even existed that early, proving that this was a much later rendition. Number seven, it forbids Muslims from taking building material from churches to use in their mosques. There were no mosques in Egypt in 625, so how could it forbid them? This doesn't make sense. Those only came into existence in Egypt in 641, 16 years later. So you can see this is historical anachronism after historical anachronism. It permitted the Christians to decide the rate of their jizya, but there is no example anywhere for this. Number nine, the term malak mukara or angel of proximity only cited in Sufi, is only cited in Sufi writings and first was introduced by Mutnabi in 965. That's the 10th century or up to the 13th century, which is three to 500 years too late. The covenant of the prophet Muhammad with the Jews was known first by Wakili. Uh, he writes this in 823. That's the 9th century. So therefore, even if it was this covenant uh, with the Jews, that we, you can see we're going to get to that next. That is not this letter. And anyways, that's much, much too late. OK, so we can pretty well throw that one out as a fraud. Let's go to the next slide and we'll conclude. This is what the scholars say. Bernard Moritz, a classic work done on this document in 1980, says the impossibility of finding this document to be authentic is clearly apparent. Date, style, and contents each independently provide its inauthenticity. Dr. Pat Anderson says the dating is too late and the, and the originals not produced in an age of papyrus are lost. The criteria for authenticity that Moro, the man who's done the most worst research on it, he's a convert to Islam, suggests the suggests does not meet the standards of valid historical criticism. Dr. Mark Dewey concludes, this letter appears to address characteristic abuses of Dimis in terms which only make sense after the Dimi regulations were established, so long after Muhammad's time. I suspect that it is later, namely during the period of the Turkish invasion of Egypt in early 16th century. Next slide. It's not invasion, Jay. We went there to share life. That's your good old Turkish spin on it. Thank you for doing that. And the number four, Amadou Ola Lekan Sani says, referring to the covenant of Muhammad, he says, we find no evidence of pre-16th century codices at all. Gabriel said Reynolds says, it's forged by Christians intent on proving to their Muslim overlords that the prophet himself had guaranteed their well-being and the preservation of their property. They are all quite late. They date to the 16th century, over 800 years after the death of Muhammad. So my conclusion is, taking this all together, I would say the monks of St. Catherine's Monastery in the 16th century needed protection from the marauding Muslims all around then. So they forgot, they forged this letter and then added Muhammad's name to it to give it authority in order to safeguard their monastery. The fact that Muslims today, like John Moreau, are also using this document in the 21st century to support their narrative of a peaceful Islam is indeed rather ironic. Therefore, they would have an agenda as well. Okay, let's go then to another one. This is the Constitution, Constitution of Medina. Oh, before we go back, just go back to that. I'm... I did this, I put this up, this this thing about Astanami back in April, and I got some letters, some really nasty uh, emails from uh, Greek, or I'm sorry, Egyptian Orthodox people who were quite upset with me for my conclusion, because they believed that these are authentic, and these were Christians, these were not Muslims, these were Christians, and they said, because of my conclusion, because I, I've said this now on YouTube, there are going to be uh, Christians who are going to be killed, because they no longer are going to hold to this to this Ashtanami letter. And this is one of the dilemmas of working with history. When you work with history, you're gonna to come to conclusions that not everybody likes. And this would be one case in point. And I got some really nasty letters from people saying, you have done an injustice to God. You are now endangering people's lives because you are saying this on YouTube. People may be killed because of this, because now they know that, they now the Muslims know they don't have to protect those Christians in 
Egypt. So it's, it's one of the difficulties of knowing what to do with history. I'm just telling you as I see it, and therefore people are going to have to come to their conclusions on that. Let's go to the next one, and that's the Constitution of Medina. Let's come on down to a picture of it. And this was done on April. I'll go back one. As I put this one up on April 20. If you just go back one slide. April 28th. So if you want to see this one, it's much more in-depth. These uh, What I'm doing now are just I'm uh, doing a quick overview. So there's the Constitution of Medina. Uh, next slide. And you can see this is nothing more than a facsimile. This is not the original. There is no original. We can't find original. But this is a facsimile of the roughly, I think, 20 to 30 different articles. The Constitution of Medina was a document supposedly created by Muhammad when he first moved to Medina somewhere between 622 and 624, according to the traditions. It, and it, again, it was an agreement between the three major groups then in Medina, the Ansar, who were the native Arabs of Medina, the Jews, who were the native Jews of Medina, and Muhammad uh, and the Mahajiru, those who have moved from Mecca to Medina with him uh, in 622. Now, Muslims consider it a model for agreements today. They claim that it is the oldest constitution for mankind. They claim that it is the oldest example of multi-faith, multiculturalism. And they claim that it is an egalitarian document guaranteeing religious liberty and equality for all. And that's why they're pushing it so much. And I, I don't know if you're still getting it at Speaker's Corner, Hatu. I used to get it. Quite a few people would bring this as a document saying, this is the authentic, This we need to get back to this document. Have you have you received this kind of, um, of push? Yeah, yeah, it's the, it's the same, yeah. Still, this is and it's also used. It's also used to confront the uh, or to support why Muhammad had to uh, confront the Banu Kainuka and the Banu Qurayshi, especially yeah. Banu Qurayshi, when they were killed in 627. They say it's because they reneged on the Constitution of Medina. They reneged on this document. So you'll hear this used often. But what most Muslims are using it for is to prove that Muhammad existed, to prove that it was there. Since he wrote it, therefore, that proves he exists. How could a non-existent person write such a great document? Let's go to the next slide, slide number 56. When you look at the Consul of Medina, this is what I, I'm not going to go through all the articles. It Basically, it says that Christians can gather anywhere and Muslims will protect their buildings. It gives no one can plunder Christians or destroy their churches or take anything from within. You can see why it's so popular. This is great for today. This is very politically correct. A Christian woman must, must give her consent before she marries a Muslim man. That's just like the Ashtunami. Christian women married to Muslim men are free to go to their churches. Christians can build and repair churches and convents. And that Christians cannot participate in the military, much like the Ashtunami. Next slide, please. So content, as far as the content is concerned, you can see why it's popular. Now, the problems I have with the Constitution. First and foremost, it is clearly pro-Jewish. Yet there is no record of it in any Jewish historical documents. No Jew that I know even has heard about this. If this was such a great document for them, would they be the first ones to bring it up all forward to actually prove that they uh, they they are, are to be redeemed by Muslims? There is no archaeological evidence for the existence of Jews in Medina or in its vicinity that early. When you look at um, Hoyland's book, Seeing Islam on the other side, the one I have right here, this book right here, Hoyland's book, he is very clear that there were no Jews further south than Khaybar, which is much, much further north. And he said even Medina Sali is probably as far south as the Jews got. So how could there be Jews living in Medina? What are you going to do with these three Jewish tribes? They didn't. We don't have any records of them. There is no records of them. So that would be a problem with this document. It also contradicts the Siddha in the Hadith treatment of Jews, which is much more cruel. The Isnads for the Constitution are confused with different versions. And why in the world would they even need the Isnads if they have the document in place? More than that, the Quran does not refer to any Constitution of Medina itself. No Jew would sign a treaty. And this is one thing I always say. If I were a Jew or even a Christian, would I sign the treaty? Because look at the first article. The very first article gives authority to Muhammad to be the arbiter between man and God. What Jew would sign that article? Would you, Hatu? Not really. None of us would give authority to a someone who's not part of our tradition and who's certainly not part of our faith. Number seven, it doesn't appear until the Sirah of Ibn Hisham in 833, that's the ninth century, so much, so therefore much too late to be authentic. And number eight, Muslims should be careful of accepting such a treaty as authentic as it contradicts so much of the Quran 
Quranic view of Jews. It's not only the Quranic view, it contact, as I said earlier, it also contradicts the the Sira and the Tafsir. Yeah, go ahead to the, to the next to the next slide. So scholars conclusions. Robert Hoyland doubts is authenticity, saying there is not a single clearly Jewish inscription that has yet been found at Mecca or Yathrib or Khaibar, despite quite a number of epigraphic surveys conducted at all three sites. It is only Muslim tradition that informs us of a Jewish community in Yathrib, or in other words, that far south. Frederick M. Denny, Ibn Ishaq, now again, he's saying Ibn Ishaq, let's put Ibn Hisham there. Ibn Ishaq, or rather Ibn Hisham, preserved this ancient document, which does not appear in any other historical source. It seems to consist of separate documents from differing times in Medina. Dr. Pat Andrew says this, if there is no extent archaeological evidence for Jews in Yathrib Medina, then it is impossible that the so-called Constitution of Medina is historically valid. Rather, it is a legendary apocryphal construct. Now, comparison, it would be as if, and this is what uh, Pat Andrews went on to say, it would be as if the 1812 war between the U.S. and the U.K. was written in 2012, or the 1815 Battle of Waterloo was written in 2015. It's just, just too too much too late, 200 years too late. It's just written, again, too, much too late to be authentic. Okay, so that's the Astinami and that's the Kashan Divya. What about the Doctrine Iacobi? And this is probably the most popular one. And I did a uh, film on this on May 18th, um, much more in depth. But let's look at the Doctrine Iacobi. The Doctrine Iacobi, if you look at it, and, and we don't have it, I have a picture, I have a whole, I'm holding up there, not the, doc, not the actual document, it's nothing more than uh, basically a quotation from it. There it is on the screen there as well. The Doctrine of Iacobi is a Greek Christian polemical tract from Carthage, which is way over in North Africa, way to the west in what is would be Tunis today, but written in Palestine by a Christian apologist. So it's from Carthage, Tunis, written by a Palestine who is a Christian apologist. Boy, that's confusing. Within the debate that ensues in this passage, written by someone named Abraham, who relates some quite startling information concerning the appearance of a new prophet among the Saracens. And this is, now this is the quote, and I want you to look at this quote. And they were saying that the prophet had appeared, the prophet, doesn't name him, just says the prophet had appeared, coming with the Saracens, that's the Arabs, and that he was proclaiming the advent of the anointed one, the Christ who was to come. What can you tell me about this prophet who has appeared with the Saracens? He is false, he said, for the prophets do not come armed with a sword. So I, Abraham, inquired and heard from those who had met him that there was no truth to be found from those who had met him, that there was no truth uh, found from the so-called prophet, only the shedding of men's blood. He says also that he has the keys of paradise, which is incredible. In other words, which is not credible, is what he's saying here. Okay, so now, what are my problems with this? Let's go to the next next slide. Number one, how can you have a Muslim prophet proclaiming the Christ who was to come unless he was a Jewish Messiah? In the Quran in Surah 3340, it says that Muhammad is the last prophet. So there again, that contradicts the Quran. This passage assumes Muhammad is still alive in 634, but according to the Islamic traditions, he died in 632. So that contradicts the traditions. This prophet also has keys of paradise, which confronts the Islamic traditions. This prophet is more than likely a Jew, as it fits a Judeo-Christian monotheistic background. The anointed one of to come, this is Christ, or Christos in Greek, Mashiach in Hebrew, who was yet to come. And he has the keys of paradise. That is from Matthew 16, verse 19, referring to Peter's papal authority in the Catholic Church. More than that, this prophet spoke Aramaic, not Arabic. Now, first of all, Jews would not know Arabic, and Muhammad certainly would not know Hebrew. So can you see how there's a problem coming and going with this doctrine, Yacobi? They've got the wrong man at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. I would suggest, therefore, that, and let's go ahead and look at the quotes, because uh, you can see from their quotes that there's a problem here. Crone and Cook say this. This testimony is, of course, irreconcilable with the Islamic account of the prophet's career. It contradicts it right and left and center. We have here older material, a stratum of belief, older than the Islamic tradition itself. John Wansborough, who is considered to be one of the leading scholars there, uh, who is head of department at School of Oriental African Studies in the University of London, who was the one that taught Crone and also Cook, says prophethood was a monotheistic constant, a basic belief, concrete examples of which arose in the area in early monotheistic religion. The specific manifestation 
of course, differing from religion to religion. In other words, every leader claimed to be a prophet in order to be, get credibility. This is normal. Everyone. So whoever that was in Jerusalem was a prophet. Yes, no one doubts that. But then there was a whole proliferation of prophet is what he was saying here. Where in the world did this idea this could be Muhammad? Neville and Koran, Koran go on and say, the doctrine of Iacobi provides no support for the identification of this prophet that he was Muhammad. In fact, if one thing is clear, it is that the account in the doctrine of Iacobi does not describe the Muhammad that we know. He could more easily be almost anybody else. In those troubled years, there can have been no shortage of such prophets appealing to the various Christian and Jewish sects. Okay, go to the next slide, and we'll end with this. Robert Spencer. Inasmuch as the keys of paradise, he zeroes in on this, are more akin to Peter's keys to the kingdom of heaven than to anything in Muhammad's message, the prophet in the doctrine Iacobi seems closer to a Christian or Christian-influenced messianic millennialist than to the prophet of Islam as he is depicted in Islam's canonical literature. So he is very clear that this could not, this must not be the Muhammad of the tradition, someone completely else, but not Muhammad. Yes, a prophet, possibly, as everybody called themselves prophets. My conclusion, there is no reference to the name Muhammad, no reference to this prophet being a Muslim or belonging to the religion of Islam, nor any reference to the city of Mecca, nor his book, the Quran. He sounds more like an Arab Christian brigand employing the status of a prophet to gain himself more credibility and authority. There's just nothing Muslim about him. And that's my conclusion. Okay, let's then go to Muhammad in the Quran. This is now uh, a thing that I did up in June 7th. Uh, 2020. And this comes from Murad. Who is Murad? Murad is a Middle Easterner. I can't say anything more than that. Uh, who lives in the Middle East, who has been spending years and years. He, he, he reads and writes Arabic, Aramaic. Of course, he reads Arabic. He speaks English fluently, and he also understands Syriac. So he is one of the best ones I have found who actually has gone to the original sources. He's a good friend from the Middle East, and he's been up on my, I, I brought him on board maybe three or four times, and he has been such a help, especially when it comes to the Quran and especially the Dome of the Rock. So this is what he says. It's only one slide. And he says this about the references to Muhammad, because Muhammad's name is in the Quran just four times. There they are. Surah 3, Ayah 144. Surah 33, Ayah 40. Surah 47, Ayah 2. And Surah 48, Ayah 24, 29. But this is the only place you will see Muhammad's name in the Arabic. Now, I have heard many people say, oh, he's all through the Quran. Yes, in the English translation, he has been introduced there in English because the Muslims have attributed, there again, they're attributing that reference or that verse or that representative of God or the prophet of God or the Nabi of God. They're attributing that to Muhammad. That's all you're reading. That's nothing more than an English translation. And that's what we called, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Well, um, well, I can't think of the word off the top of my head. So what they're, what, that's tafsir. That's tafsir that's been added into that. That's commentary. So this is nothing more than commentary when you see Muhammad's name in the English translation. His name is not in the Arabic, except for those four verses. Now, he says this. They most likely refer instead to the Blessed One, because in every case, in chapter 3, 33, 47, 48, it's the Blessed One. And then he shows, when you look at it, it's not really referring to a man at all. Or if it is the Blessed One, not Muhammad, the person name, but looks more like the probably the figure of Jesus, in because this is a confrontation of Byzantine Christianity. Therefore, his conclusion is, if this is correct, then the Muslims cannot use the Quran to support Muhammad's existence in the 7th century, not up and not at least until the uh, including the earliest manuscripts. And one of the foundational pillars of Islam begins to fall. So do not say that this is Muhammad the, the man. So when I asked him in the show, when he came on, I said, well, then when do you think Muhammad the man actually came into being? When was he then this attribution of the blessed one attributed to him? When did he finally get that nomenclature? And he says around 7.30. Now, I asked Robert Spencer this very same thing, because he also believes that this is not Muhammad in the Quran. And interestingly, independent of each other, both Robert Spencer and Murad both claim that it happened around 7.30. Why? You're going to see. Hold on. That, we have to go to the rock inscriptions. Let's now go to the Dome of the Rock. Let's go to the next category. So now we come to the Dome of the Rock. This is a film that I put up on June 9th up on Fander Films. You can go up and see it. And this one has had huge number of hits. 70 to 80,000 people have watched this one. People seem to like this one because this one really does resonate with people. When 
and this is why I use both Mel and Murad. Mel is my friend from uh, Ireland. Murad is my friend from the Middle East. They've worked together for years. They've, uh, they've come on board with me. We're working together. It's great to see what we're doing. They brought another guy named Joe. This guy, Joe, is, I mean, I have a hard time keeping up with him. He is so quick with his historical survey. The guy has been working on this material for 20 years. But let's go with what they said about the Dome of the Rock. We've always assumed that the inscriptions on the Dome of the Rock, remember those inscriptions that I've always talked about? Hatun, you've heard me talk about that in the inner ambulatories uh, that are there in the central part of the Dome of the Rock. Those are the only original part of that building. That Dome of the Rock has been destroyed and rebuilt 11 times. The only original part are those ambulatories where those two green arrows are. See those two green arrows there on the picture? That's the inner ambulatory. Everything else outside of it have been built much, much later. In fact, the dome that you're looking at today, that dome, that beautiful golden dome, was built in 1876, a little over 100 years ago. But those ambulatories were built in 691, 691, the late 7th century by Abdel Malik. And it was here that the Shahada was first introduced by Abdel Malik. He also introduced it on coins at the same year. He also introduced it on his protocols, the Caliph protocols, the same year. Mel from Sneakers Corner and Murad from the Middle East choose to disagree. Much like Muhammad's name in the Quran, these inscriptions do not refer to a man named Muhammad at all, but to the Blessed One, much like those three verses in the Quran. That's an enormous jug you're putting up there. Yikes. <laughs> You're going to drown in that. No. So here you go. See, I'm seeing it 20, 20, 20 seconds later, so I didn't catch you while it happened. But here you have, you have the blessed one who could very well be Jesus, they're saying. The Quranic verses in these inscriptions are not the same as that which we have in the Quran today and are thus possibly the precursors to the Quranic verses, which were written later. That's now, can you understand then why the Quranic verses, the four verses we're talking about, why they don't have there? That he, he should be all through the Quran if he really was the person that the Quran is, was, was revealed to. He should have his name all replete, like Jesus' name in the Bible. But it's not there. It's not, so the conclusion, it's go ahead. Like I remember this like in 2000, um, before I came to speaker school, I remember like um, those arguments where like it, it is the same argument that um, if, if it is the praise one, if it is the Muhammad and then you look into yeah. it and then you come to conclusion that it's praise one. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So this is the same argument. So you've heard this before, but they have actually gone much deeper to look and show. And here's what's interesting. Murad is coming out. I can't say it yet because I don't want to jump the gun on him, but he's coming out. And he's showing that almost all of these are Aramaic. These are Aramaic expressions that come from Nabataean Aramaic. Have I not said that tonight? No, you haven't said that. I have said that tonight. Remember when I talked about the Southern Levant? Remember I talked about the Tarmat Buddha, the Aleph Maksura, the Aleph. These are all from Nabataean Aramaic, which are from the Southern Levant, which are way up north. So that has yet to be recorded. We're going to get into that. that this is all so exciting, Hutton. We're getting so much new material that I even I can't keep up with it. But this is why it makes my our job, yours and my job, so much easier. Okay, let's go to the next one. So now we come to the coins. Hatun, October 6th. This is when I put this up. So it's just earlier this month. Remember, Hatun, when we were there at the British, Muse British Library, uh, sorry, British Museum, Almost a year ago. Do you remember that? Yes. You took me down there. You wanted me to look at these new galleries. You didn't want me to look at the coins. You wanted me to look at other ottomans. But I came across the coin. And I saw this one reference to the Shahada that no, is, and I, it was after. No, I took you there for you to look at the coins. Oh, okay. So you did take me to the coins. Yeah. By the way, this is this is this is not beer. I don't sit there and drink beer when I'm on live stream. This is iced tea. I have to keep reminding because people have got upset with me. So here we were. We were at the British Museum, and you want and what is it about the coins you want me to see? Uh, the your dates and the things on them. Remember, we even take a picture, and then we we talked about it. We compared your pictures and my pictures. And what was the thing especially that we didn't like or that we thought was a problem? Uh, the, the, your dates on them. Okay, but what date? I mean, it was the Shahada that was dated to 661 because it was the Shahada on a coin uh, that was coined, that was minted by Mu'awiyah. That was the problem. 
Yeah, even we send the picture to someone to ask if the person can read that, what it says. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's when I came back. I quickly started going and I started reading this material, all this. These are all the, the different articles that I got. Uh, this one is, and I came home, I came back to the United States after being with you there. Uh, this one was written by Michael Bates. Michael Bates is probably one of the senior numismatists in the world. He is part, uh, He is the one that is probably seen, knows most about the coins than anybody else. I, I looked at it. I went to uh, uh, this article written by Andre Gaudi and Wolf, Wolfgang Schultz. Really in-depth article going through all the uh, Islamic coins, all the earliest Islamic coins, yeah, and remember, he wrote this. Remember, I sent you the a draft of the like first problem, and then we even had brother Al Fadi came, and then we talked about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hadn't read those articles when my when I talked to you. Uh, these articles just open it up, and here's Luke Treadwell, 2014. He talks about the symbolism and meaning of the early Islamic copper coinage in Greater Syria. And then you have the coinage of the first caliph written by Michael Markowitz. This is one that I use quite a bit in February and March. But the one that I used the most was this one here, Coins of Two Realms by Clyde Foss. Clyde Foss here in America is probably considered to be the world of the American authority on the Islamic coins. And that's why he's so, uh, so trusted. But this then came up after I did my video on the coins, this guy was sent to me, Tony God Goodwin from 2016. So these are just four, five, five, six years ago. They're all rather recent. And what's exciting about them, they all understand coins. They're numismatists. This is their area of expertise. Let's go to the next slide. But here's the problem. They know the coins. They've always knew that they were important. They've always known that coins are something that we need to look at. The difficulty is they didn't know what they, how to interpret the coins. Now, let's look and let's do a historical overview of coinage. What we know is that the Lydians introduced coins around 600 BC. So they've been around for at least 1,200 years before the Muslims really got into coinage. They were used for far more than just for commerce. They were primarily used, well, they were used for commerce, but secondarily they were used to, make, to introduce and maintain a, a, a ruler's identity. Because they didn't have TV or internet or newspaper or radio and all this stuff back then, they had to use coins to introduce themselves whenever they came to power. Because they knew that everybody would hold the coins and handle the coins and see their image on the coins. And therefore, that was a quick way to tell everybody, I'm the new guy in town. I'm the new man in town. So since everyone had to use them, a ruler knew that the best way to introduce them was to mint new coins. Next slide. They bore the image of the ruler. That's the first thing. It's important you either put the image of yourself or you put the image of someone who's inter who is very important to your identity, in other words, to your empire. That's what's important. And then they would always put the name of the religion. Now, they usually they didn't usually write the name. They would put a symbol to symbolize the name. So if you were Christian, you put a cross. If you were Zoroastrian, you put a fire altar. If you were a Muslim... They should have put something to introduce it, but they did Islam. Well, hold on, hold on to that. And they always employed dates because therefore they could, they would usually date it usually when they came to power or, or somebody in the, in the empire who came to power. And they always be, they always then always wrote the name of the mint, where that mint came from, where that position came from, permitting us to follow the chronology and the place of origin. Next slide. But here's the problem. The numismatists, these guys that I just put up, all these different guys, they were writing these articles. And I was reading their articles and I was saying, wow, these guys really have a problem. They've got the same problem we've got. They've got the same problem that all of anybody who's looked at Islam has, because what they're doing is they're looking at these coins in their hands, and a lot of them own these coins. They're looking at the images. They're looking at the dates. They're looking at the references. They're looking at the inscriptions around them. And then they're looking at the new traditions. Saying, now, how do we interpret this from those traditions? How do we interpret this from Ibn Hisham, al wikiri Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, Al-Tabari? How do we interpret everything that from, that from what Islam is telling us? And they were frustrated because they couldn't find. It just didn't make sense. It wasn't making sense to them. And a number of these guys, not these guys, others who are newest this, as I start putting up and I say, hold on a minute. Why are we letting the traditions tell us what these coins say? 
What in the world are we doing? Why in the world are we letting that, the 9th and 10th century, tell us what was being written or put together or minted in the 7th century? Let's let the coins talk to us. Let the coins describe themselves. And I started getting these emails from different numismatists from, from France and from Germany and even here in the United States. They started emailing me and they were actually they were putting comments on the bottom of the of my video. And they said, Could you get in touch with us? Could you get in touch with us? And so I would get in touch with them. And here what they were telling me is, you're the first one that's actually done what we should have been doing. You're the first one that said, forget the traditions, look at the coins as standalones. Just look at the coins as standalones. Now tell me what you see. Describe what you see on those coins and what is the story they give you? Because those coins have a story. They do have a story. But it's not the story that the inter, the, inter, the Abbasid traditions, I'm going to call them Abbasid traditions from here on out. These Abbasid traditions from 833, 870, 923, those are the Abbasid traditions. Don't listen to them because they don't know that story because they're not in the 7th century. These coins are pristine. These coins do not disintegrate. And that's where I said, now tell me now what they tell you. This is what they first say. Look at the next slide. First of all, they say these coins are all minted too far north. Wait a minute. Didn't I already say that earlier tonight? Have you noticed how many times I've said too far north, too far north, too far north? Look where the mints are on the left, the modern day mints. On the, and you have two different sets of coins is what they told me. In the west, over here in the west, you had gold solidices and you had copper coins. So gold and copper. Those are all attributed or they all came about from the Byzantine era. The Byzantines use gold. The Byzantines use copper. Therefore, the Arabs who now have hegemony, the Arabs who now have their own, they have now thrown out the Byzantines. They now have the empire. They now control all this area. They control. Remember, the Umayyads were all living in Damascus. That's in Syria. Take a look and see where it is on the map there. So they owned all this land from Syria. They owned all the land, including what is today Lebanon and what is today Israel. And going to the east then, going to the other direction over here, they also learned all the land from Iran, Afghanistan, all the way up to Afghanistan. So all this land from Afghanistan all the way over to Tripoli in the west. Afghanistan in the east to Tripoli in the west. By the time Mu'awiyah comes to power, all that land is under his control. And therefore, they now have taken over these mints. These mints that were they were creating these coins existed before they were in power. So they just took over these mints and they minted new coins. And you can see the mints. They're the name of the mints on the left. I don't. That's not big enough for me to see right now. Probably you can read them better than I can. Hatu. No, no, you've got the bad glasses, so you can't really see them. But you can see the mints on the left, and you can see they're all there, round in Israel and mostly in Syria. The ones over in the east are all in Iran. Bishapur, Dasht, Arajan, Tanbu, Kazarud, Ardasharkura, Shiraz, Ishtakar, Darab, especially Darab Jib. That was one of the biggest ones. Kavad Kura. So here they have, they now control the mints, and they were minting coins. No one is suggesting they did not mint coins. Of course they were, because now they controlled the mints. You don't just sit back and not use them. No, you want to make everybody to know who you are. So these mints are all up in the north. In the west, they're in Syria. In the east, they're in Iran. Okay, next slide. Now, since, what then should we do? Since the Islamic traditions assumed that there was a well-established Muslim empire by the time of Muhammad's demise in 632, since they also assumed that during the reign of the rightly guided caliphs, that's Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, from six, well, actually it's uh, Muhammad as well, 624 to 661, that the empire expanded from Tripoli in the west to Afghanistan in the east, there should be some evidence in this vast swath of land for this empire. There should be at least coins which were minted by the caliphs. People under authority needed coins to do commerce. The caliphs also needed to announce their authority. Let's then look at the coins in the 7th century and see what we find. Next slide. And here's the first question. This is the question they all said to me. Where are the Islamic coins from 624 to 660? From 624, when, when the, the caliphate comes to power, when Muhammad introduces the caliphate, now there is a caliphate there in Medina, to 632 when Abu Bakr takes over, to 634 when Umar takes over, to 644 
uh, sorry, 644 when Uthman takes over to 656 when Ali takes over to 661 when Muawiyah takes over. That four, that roughly 40 year period, let's take them 624 to 660. Where are there any Islamic coins? What do I mean by Islamic coins? Anything with Muhammad or Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman or Ali's name on it. That's all I want. They've, you've got to find those names. You've got to find something about Islam on those coins. There is no reference whatsoever in the seventh century for anything Islamic. Volker Pop talks about that. So does Goodwin. I've given you the references there. Coins are rarely mentioned in the Quran as well. Why? Was this due to negligence? Were the early Arabs not sophisticated enough? Listen, they control those mints. Those mints didn't just stop making coins. Coins were being made. Who was making them? Well, obviously, the rulers of that area were making them. Like everything else, there simply are no extent records from that time at all, including coins, though Muslims claim there were. And this fact in and of itself is curious, if Islamic traditions are correct. Next slide. I want to just look at this map. Look at this map and you see what I'm talking about. Now, when you look at the map, you'll notice by the time that by the time that Muhammad dies, that brown area is under their control. So that includes the Hejaz, which is the brown area, and a little bit over of Oman over there in the west. I'm sorry, in the east. By the time that the by by the time the, the, that uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali come to power, all the orange area comes under their jurisdiction. So that whole orange area is now under the jurisdiction of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. Yeah, look at the cursor that Hatun is doing. Thank Hatun for doing that. So that whole orange area is now under their control. Take a look at how big that area is. So that includes also the Hijaz, which is the brown area. The brown and the orange area that includes. Let's start from the let's uh, let's uh, let's start from the east. That includes Afghanistan, Baluchistan. That includes Iran. That includes Iraq. That includes Syria. That includes Arabia. That includes Egypt, all the way over to Tripoli. So parts of Algeria as well. So there you see all that land was under the control. That's an enormous amount of land. And all of the mints are in Syria. See where the word Syria is? And over in Iraq. See where Isfahan is? So over where Isfahan is, over in Iran. No, a little bit to the right, to the right, right there, and down by the sea. That whole area is where the mints are. So that's where the coins were being made. That's in the heart of the Islamic world. That's in the heart of where Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali were living and serving and also reigning. But they were way up in Damascus. Show where Damascus is. Over there, uh, over over by Syria, there is Damascus. Well, okay, yeah, in the land part. So that is where all this, that's where the coins should be coming from. All right, do you get that image? Now let's go to the next slide. Because the next slide shows us that there were many coins. And there's, I, I don't have time to go through all of them. I'll just show you this one here. And the coins that were being minted in these mints by Arabs, these are all Arab coins. Take a look at those red squares. Those are crosses on the head of the of the of the rulers, and crosses are on the staff that they're holding. On the back side of the coin, the reverse side has a capital M, a large M. That's the the large M is the Greek number for the denomination forty numi. That's how much it costs. Look at the top of it. There is a cross. These were Christians. There's nothing Islamic about them. How can you have Muslims? putting crosses on their head and on their staff and on the backside. Both the front and back show crosses. And so this is the lie that Islam has been telling us. So even those under the rule of the Byzantines still seem to retain a Christian identity. Go to the next slide. Here you have other Umayyad coins. Up Now we got into Umayyad. I'm jumping now because... I, Almost all the coins that we see up until the time of Muya all have crosses. So whether it is over in the east or in the west. But listen, I'm going to make two different things. Because when Muawiyah comes to power, there are distinctly two different types of coins. In the west, they are all gold and they are all copper. In the east, they are all silver. The obverse side means the front side of this coin that was minted by Mu'awi in 661, that continue all the way up in 680, has a picture of a Byzantine emperor Heraclius and his son. On the reverse side, it has a Latin inscription in the Byzantine cross minus the cross piece at the top. Thus, this coin was boycotted by the Christians because it desecrated the Byzantine cross. What's the significance? 
Why would Mu'awiyah, a Muslim, show a Christian emperor and his son and not himself on this coin? Note, this coin is still not Islamic. So because this coin was boycotted, go to the next slide, he introduced the next coin. And he introduces this coin with his image on it. Now look at him. What's above his head? And what's on his staff? 661 to 680, this coin continues. On the front side, Mu'awiyah went back to a picture of a faceless emperor with a cross above his head and in his hand, see the red square. On the reverse side, he retains the number 40 Ume with the cross above it. Duplicate the Christian? Was this duplicated or was he a Christian himself? The significant is, and the question I ask is, why would Mu'awiyah need to duplicate the Christians if the Arabs now control Damascus? Note, this coin is still not Islamic, even up to 680. Remember, Muhammad died in 632. So we are 50 years later, and there's stuff, nothing Islamic about it, at least in the West. These are the Western coins. Let's go to the next one. In the East, however, he's introducing these coins. These are the ones on the front side. You have the Arab Sassanian anonymous bust on the margin. It reads, Ilala, unto Allah. Now, Muslims have come back to me and say, ah, that's, that's Islamic. No, it is not. As you well know, Hatun Allah, Ilaha, is from Nabitian Arabic, Aramaic. Everybody used Allah as their God. The Christians used Allah. The Zoroastrians used Allah. So did the Arabs use Allah. What's more important, look at the reverse side. On the reverse side is a typical Arab Sassanian fire altar with attendants with the mint name Darab Girt, modern Iran. So that comes from Iran. There is a Zoroastrian fire altar on the back. What would a Muslim be doing with a Zoroastrian fire altar? Significance, Allah's name now appears on the Umayyad coins. This is not surprising as this name would have been borrowed from the earlier Nabataean name for God, Ilaha. All Arabs use the name Allah. Next, next slide. He then introduces a new coin in 663. This is the one here. Obverse side, the front side, written in the middle version, Mu'awiyah Amir Iwrishnikan, which means Mu'awiyah, commander of the faithful. In the margin, Bismillah, in the name of God. So there the Bismillah is used. Again, that is not Islamic. What is interesting is you might see, if you look at the red squares, do you notice the moon and the stars? Is that Islamic? No, it is not. That is Sassanian. That is the em emblem for authority in the Persian Sassanian Empire since the second century AD. In fact, it looks like it's the Muslims that borrowed it from the Sassanians, but the Muslims do not borrow that symbol for Islam until the Ottoman period. Okay, Hatun, when was the Ottoman period? When was it introduced? Um, 1400s, I don't know. 1400, exactly. So you're talking a good 700 years later. On the reverse side, there's the fire altar again. Say again? 1453. That's 14, yes, 15th century. So here, in then in 667, he introduces this one. On the obverse side, it says Bismillah Malik. So in the name of God, the king. This is not the Bismillah in the Quran. This is saying in the name of God, which is the name of Allah, he, him now referring to himself. And then on the typical Sassanian fire altar with attendants and mint name from Bishapur in modern Iran. The sequence starts with unto Allah, then Muwaya adds in the name of Allah, and here he adds the king. Yet there is still no reference to Muhammad's name or anything else. Next slide. We now finally come to a Muslim coin. This is the first coin that is Islamic. It's introduced in 692 by Abdul Malik. I know there's some have disputed that there's an earlier coin than this that has the that has the shahada on it. I will I, I will say fine. That is from Zubair in 687. The problem is who was ruling Zubair, who was over Zubair, and it is not on a golden solar disc. It's on a silver coin, and the silver coins were in Iran. They were not considered to be authoritative. The golden solar discs. That means he had it in Syria. It was confronting. It was confronting directly the Byzantine. Christianity. So on the front side, Abdul Malik tries to pay tribute to Justinian II using this gold coin, and they go to war. Why? Because he's taken the crosses off it. He's taken the crosses off. No longer is there a cross. There had always been a cross up until this point. And then on the reverse side, a staff of the globe replacing the Byzantine cross and inscribed Bismillah Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah. In the name of God, there is no God but God alone. Muhammad is his messenger. This coin is the first to introduce Muhammad, and it is definitely Islamic, but is it really the first to do so? That, let's go on back. Let's go to the next slide. 
Because of the fact that Justinian goes to war with him because of that coin, he then introduces this coin in 693. Now, this coin has his own image on it, holding a sword. This is an announcement of war. Abdul Malik's image is on the text reading, the servant of God, Abdul Malik, commander of the believers. On the reverse side, a staff with the globe, Qutb, and the inscribed round is La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. There is no God but God and Muhammad, and Muhammad is the messenger. There is the Shahada, both on the gold coin and the copper below it. These gold and copper coins replace the earlier ones. Now only Abdul Malik is pictured as a servant of God and commander of the believers. Note there is, uh, there is an image still included. This goes against every Islamic tradition. Nobody can have images on themselves, of themselves. So this also rejects the Islamic traditional account. Nonetheless, once he introduces this one, it's not till 696. Sorry, go to the next slide, 696, that he then takes off the image and look what he does. He then introduces this on the obverse. La ilaha illallah, wahadullah, sharikala. There is no God but God alone. He has no associates. That is not part of the shahada. What is it doing there? He has no associates. Well, obviously, this is confronting Byzantine Christianity. I won't go into the Arabic. Look at the obverse around it again. This is on the obverse in the front. It says, Muhammad is the messenger of God whom he sent with the guidance and the religion of truth that he might make it over all, prevail over all religions, even if the associators are reversed. So now he's confronting the Christianity because they are the associators. They are the ones that believe another with God. They are the ones that lift, and lift another alongside God. They are seen as the associators, and therefore he is now going to prevail over them. On the backside, he says God is one, God the eternal. He does not beget, and he was not begotten. Who is that confronting? That's confronting Jesus Christ again. It's confronting his begettenness. That's confronting John 3.16. So the coin not only introduces Muhammad, but attacks Jesus' divinity, John 3.16, and supports Islam's superiority. This definitely is now a Islamic coin. No, no longer are there any images of anybody. And from here on out, from 696, all the coins, all the coins have only scripts. Just do one last coin there, uh, the, uh, slide number 85, because then on the east, this is done in the west. In the east, then he introduces the silver coin, exactly the same thing. There's no God but God alone. He has no associates. That's attacking Christianity. Muhammad is the messenger of God, whom he has sent with guidance and religion of truth, and he might make it prevail over all religions, even if the associators are reversed, even if you Christians don't like it. God is one, God the eternal, he did not beget and was not begotten. There he's attacking Jesus' divinity, he's attacking his begetfulness, he's attacking his sonship, and he is saying that, there, that God is one. So this coin not only introduces Muhammad and attacks Jesus' divinity, it attacks John 3.16, <coughs> all his uniqueness and Islam superiority. Okay, look at the next slide, and this shows you everything on one slide. When you look at the next slide, there it all is. <clears throat> look at the timeline. Muhammad dies in 632. The coins start to appear almost immediately. When you look at the coins, <clears throat> nothing about Muhammad on them, nothing about the Rashidun period, nothing about Mecca, which they should have written there, no names, no places that we should see from the, what Islamic traditions tell us. What's more, on the west, they are golden and proper. In the east, they are silver. These Arab coins are all Christian in the West up to 661, and all the coins are, in, are minted in either Syria or Iran way too far north. By 661, when Mu'awiyah comes to power, he's there in Damascus. He is the first caliph of the, caliph of the Umayyad caliph. Certainly he should be Muslim. But his coins have Christian crosses in the West and Zoroastrian fire altars in the East up to 680. <coughs> Still nothing Islamic. It's not till 692 that Abdul Malik finally comes and mints his first coin, which includes the Shahada. It is widely used, though it causes a war with Justinian II, so he introduces a new coin with his image on it and a sword, that he is a servant of God. <clears throat> and finally, in 696, Abdul Malik mints a coin with no image, with references attacking Christianity, his Christ divinity, and the association, the idea that we associate another with God. Let's go to our conclusions in number 87. So, Pre-660, all early coins show a clear Christian identity on both sides of the coin. 624 to, to 660, early Islamic coins just don't exist. Why? Since they control so much of the land. This is curious. 640 to 660, some Arab proxy states seem to be Christian and others seem to want to know religious symbols. 661 to 680, Mu'awiyah, that's his reign, <clears throat> retains Christian symbols up to 680, adds Allah's name but not Muhammad's. 
692, Abdul Malik introduces Muhammad categorically, possibly the first Islamic coin, though the date is disputed. 693 to 696, while truly Islamic, the images are still being used. And then finally in 696, the Arab script introduces, only an Arab script introduces Muhammad, attacks Jesus' divinity, attacks John 3.16, and introduces Islam superiority. So while Allah's name is introduced early, it's an Abitian, Muhammad's is not, he's uniquely Islamic. Doesn't the numismatic evidence support the archaeological evidence and the documentary evidence? Doesn't this therefore suggest that Islam was not introduced by Muhammad, but by Abdul al-Malik? Thus, these 7th century coins confront the traditional 9th century Islamic narratives on every score. Okay, any comeback on, to me on this, Hatu? Um, you are not going to move to the next slide? I want to ask you what you think. Is, is, this, is there a problem here? Any comeback? Any questions you have? Um, no, um, because I'm sharing the screen, so I can't keep eye on the chat. Um, so I don't know if anyone asks questions in the chat, because I need to make chat big to see it. So right now I don't have any questions. Okay, there's a question. Jay, is there evidence Muhammad died in 652 AD? Uh, there is no evidence. In fact, he didn't die in 652. The traditions say he died in 632, but we have references to him or a Muhammad uh, from the writings of Sabaeus up until 634. The doctrine Iacobi still has him alive in 634 if the doctrine Iacobi is Muhammad. I would suggest that we don't know anything about any Muhammad. You're going to see that as we get into the next material. Um, I think we can move to the next material because it's 1.33. I've got appointment at 2.30, so... Okay, we need to finish in the next half hour. And what slide are we on? About 45 minutes. Like, ideally, if I've got like five minutes before I go to my meeting, that would be helpful. So, okay. Oh, Let's, yeah. Why are you going to a meeting at 2.30 in the morning, Hatu? Jay, there is a life. life That's not happening. a life. Okay, let's, you need to sleep. Let's, let's, you need let's to sleep move. to keep hold on to your life. Let's move okay. to the next one. Ilyas Ibn Kabisa. Let's go to Ilyas Ibn Kabisa. Who is this character? Who is Ilyas Ibn Kamisa? This is a, a film that I put up on August 29th um, <clears throat> earlier this summer. Looking for the vanishing Muhammad. The traditions say that Muhammad lived in the Hejaz, and he, along with those who came after, led an invasion against the Byzantines and Persians. So, he was significant at that time. We, we cannot find anything written about him nor his conquests outside of the traditions. But we do find a man named Mahmet, referred to in documents from the 7th century, including the fragment of the chart of Jacob of Edessa in 692, the Ad Anum in 705, the Byzantine Arab Chronicle in 741 to 745, and the Zuknin Chronicle in 775. Also, Thomas the Presbyter in 640 approximately says this Muhammad was the leader of the Tayaye. Who are the Tayaye? They all suggest that this Muhammad was a king and had a lot of authority. So there is someone Muhammad, but his name is Mahmet from Tayaye that all these different documents are talking about. Now look at the dates, they are late. They are late 7th century and mid to late 8th century. But they're all referring to this Muhammad that lives in Tayaye. Next slide. To understand who this person is, we need to go back to 618 and look for the rebel leader in that year. The Hispanic Chronicle of 7454 says that the Saracens rebelled in 618 and took Syria, Arabia, and Mesopotamia for themselves. The Arabs then selected a king four years later in 622 so that he could unite them against the Saracens. Ooh, tu, 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 wait a minute. 622, Hatun, why is that important? What happened in 622? Muhammad moved to Medina. Okay, that's the Hijra. Hold on to that. Now can you understand why 622 is so important? John Bar Benkai in 690 and the Chronicles of Fredegar in 715 mentioned that they that they they had two leaders at this time. So we need to find two leaders who jointly led, possibly Mu'awiyah of Damascus in the west and Al Ali of Hira to the east. Damascus is in Syria, Hira is in Iraq. The Westerners called the Umayyads, who were the Umayyads, led by Mu'awiyah, they won. So Mu'awiyah now controls his Persian and Roman subject. The Romans are in the west, the Persians are in the east. So we are looking for a Lachmid king from 618 who became a rebel, ideally someone who was kicked out of a city, for example, Hira, which is just what is today Kufa, close to that year from which to create the Hijra out of Mecca legend later on, and who later reconquered the city. Who then is this Lachmid king? Do we have a name? In the 9th century, Al-Buhari of the traditions refers to Muhammad as Ibn Abi Kabshah, son of the father of the sheep. 
The leader of the Altayaya, who was from Hira, which is today Kufa, is referred to as Ilyas ibn Kabisa Altai, which is his official name. Next slide. Muhammad, however, was his nickname. Kabisa's nickname was Mahmed, his nom de guerre. Note how close Ibn Abi Kabsha, which is Buhari's reference to him in the 9th century, and Ilyas Ibn Kabisa, his name in the 7th century are. They're very similar, are they not? Kusral, the Sassanian king at the, that, uh, before that, needed someone in the Lakhmid area in Hira to control the Lakhmids from raiding his territory. So he appointed Ilyas ibn Kabisa as the first and last non Lakhmid king or governor in Hira between 602 to 617 and gave him 30 villages along the Euphrates. But Kabisa rebelled and joined the Arabs and was deposed. Kabisa, once deposed, became a rebel leader for the Arabs in 622. There's the date. That's why 622 is so important, and led them against the Sassanids. Thus, the reason 622 was chosen later on as Muhammad's Hijrah from Mecca to Medina, because the Arab identity began then. The 7th century Muhammad was of high status, not poor as the tradition intimate, who then moved to the west close to Jordan. Petra, perhaps? So it seems that the later traditions have the wrong Muhammad as the real Muhammad lived much further north, was wealthy, and is credited with beginning the Arab rebellion against the Sassanians and the Byzantines around 622. Something else is going to happen in 622 that also underlines that. So let's look at this map here and let's and the next slide. So look at the Lakhmids are. That's the red area. Hira is where this Ilyas ibn al-Kabisa comes from. Kabisa first lived in Hira, the capital of the Lakhmid kingdom. Once deposed, he then moved to Jordan, possibly to Petra, over here in the west. Note how far north Kufa and Petra are from the Hejaz, where Mecca and Medina are situated. The Islamic traditions stipulate that Muhammad was born and lived his whole life in the Hejaz, way down in the green area. Yet the historical Muhammad is not from there at all, but from much further north, up in the red area. That's where the original, the seventh century Muhammad was. Now his name was, his formal name was Ilyas ibn al-Kabisa, but his informal name, his nickname, his nom de guerre was Mahmud. That's the reason why Mahmud was then chosen, but possibly another century later. Now we've got the man, let's look at the place. Let's go to the next part. Next slide. A critique of Mecca historically. What Muslims claim? Well, they say that it's where Adam and Eve were thrown down to in the Garden of Eden in Surah 7. It's where Abraham lived in Surah 21 and rebuilt the Kaaba. It's where the center of, of the trade, north, south, east, uh, and west, that's Montgomery's trade route theory. So it should be one of the best known and best documented places in history, right? Next slide. We'll go through these much quicker, okay? Just, just right. So... Let's now look, but before that, go back one more slide. Let's look at the rightly guided caves. And this is a, a film that I put up on June 5th in 2020. So let's look at the rightly guided caves to see if this is all true. Let's see if the traditional account is correct. Next slide. Looking for the rightly guided caliph. We've not been able to find the Muhammad of the ninth century. So can we find anyone else? Let's start with the term caliph. There are no rock inscriptions in the 7th century which uses that term, Khalif. The term which was used was Amir al-Muminin, commander of the faithful, which does not even denote a sense of a successor. The term Khalif was a shortening of Khalifat Rasul Allah and meant successor of the messenger of God. What about any reference to the first four caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali? The historicity of the first four caliphs is seriously now in doubt. Why? Because we can't find any reference to any of these four guys who were caliphs. Yes, there are names people call Abu Bakr. That was quite normal. Umar was a very common name. Uthman was a common name. And Ali especially was a common name. So there are people called that, but none of them are caliphs. And there is no reference on any inscriptions. Certainly not on the coins, as we already looked at. Attempts at getting their story straight have failed. Abu Bakr could not have been a caliph as contradictory evidence rules that out. Umar's historicity rests on one rock inscription that could be about anyone with that name. And Ali was never a caliph as he died three years before his reign, which meant 
which was meant to have ended. So in all four cases, they got the wrong man at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. And that I haven't got time to get into. Look at the video. We go into much more in depth, Mel and I. Let's now go to the next one. Let's now go to the rock inscriptions. And these are probably some of the most devastating. The rock inscriptions are on par with the coins when it comes to really eradicating anything that's Islamic in the seventh century. This is a film that I put up on August 24th of this year. Let's go to the next slide. Why are the rock inscriptions important? Rock inscriptions are one of the best ways to know of any period in history because they are durable and they're plentiful. They're just like coins. Coins do not disintegrate. Coins do not deteriorate. The same thing with rock inscriptions. They are as pristine today as the day they were actually chiseled out. The difficulty is you cannot date them. That's the problem with rock inscriptions, whereas you can date coins. So that is one of the drawbacks with rock inscriptions. If the classical accounts concerning the emergence of Islam were true, then there should be a lot written on the inscriptions about Muhammad, about Mecca, about Islam, about Muslims and the Quran. Because according to the Islamic traditions, Muhammad and Islam were very big in that area of the world. And during that time, they, listen, it's very clear as you look at that map that I showed you earlier, they controlled all the way in uh, from Libya in the West, all the way to Afghanistan in the East. If this were the case, why are their names not on these inscriptions? We don't find not a thing at all for these five areas. For Muhammad, Mecca, Islam, Islams, or Quran, especially on the rock inscriptions from that century. Now, there are three ways to date rock inscriptions. One is the inscribers themselves, who are hired to write them, put on dates in themselves, so that similarly written inscriptions could be dated in a group. Secondly, they are dated by the evolution of the theological ideas within them. Therefore, earlier ones have little to no theology, while later ones have much more better developed theology. And then thirdly, the evolution of the script within them is also used to date them. So those are the three ways we date inscriptions. Next slide. Now, when you look at the inscriptions, the inscriptions, first of all, are in the wrong language. 30,000 rock inscriptions have now been cataloged and surveyed across Arabia, the Negev, the Transjordan, and Syria, with possibly another 70,000 more yet to go. So we're not even halfway through. One would expect Muhammad's name on the inscriptions along the Hajj routes, yet we don't find one inscription with Muhammad's name, not until 690. Isn't that about the same time that we find his name on the Dome of the Rock, the name on the coins, and his name also on the protocols? Ooh, doo, 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 doo. So the first time we see Muhammad's name on the inscriptions parallels the first time we see him on a coin or on a building or on a protocol. South of Medina, the script is Sabaic. Remember I talked about this earlier. You see that big red square at the bottom, Sabaic Arabic, originating in Yemen. It's way down in the south. So everything that's from Medina on south or Yathrib on south would have used that script. Why? Because the rock inscriptions use that script. And we're looking at rock inscription from the 7th century. They do not have the script that is used in the Quran today. The script that is used is Sabaic script way down in the south. It is the wrong script. More than that, that script has been around since 600 BC. So it's been around for 1200 years. Yet, listen to this, Hatun. I've got it underlined there. It contained all the needed vowels and consonants required for a religious text, unlike the 7th century Arabic, which is closer to Ethiopic. The Arabic script we find on these inscriptions are Nabataean. So where are the inscriptions out? Now we're up in the north. Look at the, the uh, and I should say these, these ones in the north. All the record inscriptions that are up in the north, in the other rectangle up in what is today Syria and uh, Jordan and, uh, and Israel and Lebanon. The Arabic inscriptions we find on these inscriptions are Nabataean Aramaic, only found in the north and are similar to the Quranic text. They all have the Tar Marbuta, they have the Alek Masura, they have the Aleph, they have the Ihrab, the end consonantal, uh, not consonantal, vowelization, the ending vowels. Now, can you see, can you see, fascinating, just look at that map there. Can you see everything is up north? Are you getting that? Yeah. The, now, here's the irony. As I said earlier, about a half an hour ago, if they had written the Quran, if they, if these, in, like this, in, like the inscriptions, which were using Sabaic, if they had only used, if they lived in that far south, if Muhammad actually lived there, if there was actually a Quran that was revealed to himself there, they, he would have used the Sabaic script. The Sabaic script from the very beginning, from the 600 BC, already had the dots and the vowels. 
the fact that the earliest manuscripts that we have in our hands today, the Topkapi, the Samarkand, the Ma'il, the Petropolitanus, the, uh, the, the, the Sana manuscript, all of these manuscripts do not use dots and vowels. Have you noticed that, Hutton? We've talked about this many times, which means they are all from the north. All the manuscripts are from the north. They would have been Sabaic had they been from the right area where Muhammad would have lived in Mecca or Medina. Oh, I love this. It makes my job less easier. And let's go to the next next uh, uh, the next slide. Slide 100 out of 119. Now, this one, I wish I had animation because this one is hugely important. The, the best work that has been done on the rock inscription is by Ilka Lindstedt, who's done who's dated 100 over 100 dated rock inscription, and he dated them from 640 to 740. So he dated them right during the apparent times of the rightly guided caliph all the way up until the Umayyad period to the end of the Umayyad period. So he did from 640. Uh, 640 would have been when um, um, uh, uh, Uthman would have come into power, or Abu Bakr, sorry, Umar was in power, all the way up to the time that the Umayyads leave power and the Abbasids come in. And he looked at these hundreds of these hundred rock inscriptions he looked at and he noticed that prior to 690 prior to 690 there was no evidence of anything islamic on any of the inscriptions nothing on all the inscriptions he looked at they only had pious formulas and the formulas were just what you would expect them to be bismillah they talk about allah much like you see on the coins. They are very simple, sim simplematic of the coins. That's why I say when you look at the inscriptions, you're looking at the coins. The coins and the inscriptions say the same thing. But after 690, after 690, they begin to change. It was only in the 730s, however. I'm sorry. And everything comes after 690. So from 690 to 710, Prophet Muhammad suddenly appears. From 710 to 720, Muslim rites begin to appear, such as the pilgrimages, the prayers, and the fasts. They start to appear after 710, between 710 and 720. And then from 720 to 730, he says, the names, uh, the name Muslim appears. The name Islam refers to a specific group and always used in contradistinction to Christianity. In other words, in opposition to Christianity. Conclusion? It was only in the 730s onwards that there is evidence of popular devotion to Muhammad as a prophet and messenger, which makes the Islamic traditions incredibly awkward. Furthermore, there is a hundred year silence prior to this that indicates that Islam did not exist as a distinct religion until long after the time of Muhammad, which casts doubt on what, whether he had any part in starting Islam. Next slide. The Hijra. And this is from the video that I put up on September 13th of this year. What happened in 622? Remember, I said I was going to come back to 622. Let's look at it very quickly. To understand this date, you need to look at what was happening historically. In 614 AD, the Persians defeated the Byzantines. In 622, the Byzantines under Heraclius came and defeated the Persians. This now means that there were no longer any power of Sassanians over the Arabs. And that's why the Arabs are so excited about 622. The Arabs are rejoicing because they were Christian Arabs. They were not Muslims. And they were happy that the Byzantines had finally destroyed the Persians who had persecuted them for centuries. As Christian Arabs, they now were free. That's why 622 is so important. Now can you understand why Ilyas ibn Kabisa then in 622 changes sides? And he no longer is working under Khosrau, under the Sassanids. He now joins the Arabs. He basically joins his brothers. Thus, the year 622 is important from then on, as it was the date the Arabs finally were free to create their own identity. So why create the story of the Hijrah of Muhammad moving in 622 from Mecca to Medina? Next slide. Ibn Ishaq in 765, an Abbasid, is the first to write about the Hijrah. 765. So we're told, right? It's attributed to him. This was then rewritten by Ibn Isham in 833, thus well into the Abbasid era. So therefore, there could be, have been no Hijra in 765. We have no idea because we have nothing from Ibn Ishaq. Getting back to the problem I said at the very beginning of this talk. The Abbasids hated the Umayyads and sought to eradicate much of their history, including these battles. 
They instead introduced new stories surrounding the prophet Muhammad, including this one in 622. But instead of referring to the defeat of the Persians by the Byzantines, they created a completely new narrative around Muhammad, having him move from one city to the other instead. Why? According to Murad, this suggests that they, they did this to create their own prophet, similar to but superior to the prophets of the Christian Byzantines and the Jews. Remember, and we've said this all along, Hatun, that the problem the Arabs have is that they did not have a prophetic line. They also did not have a scripture, whereas the Jews and Christians had a prophetic line and they both had their own scripture. The Arabs needed to have their prophetic line. They needed a scripture. Now the Abbasids are doing that. So what are they doing? So Muhammad's biography follows similar stories taken from the Bible of the biblical prophets and transfers them onto Muhammad, especially those of Moses, including this one of his persecution, followed by the unexodus and even entering Medina, similar to Jesus and Jerusalem. If you want to get find more material on this, look at Andy, Dr. Andy Bannister. He did his whole doctorate on this. Look at the formula of almost every one of the prophetic stories in the Quran. They are almost parallel to those that you see in the earlier prophetic stories, but they follow the same patterns, which means there are they are nothing more than oral tradition, one repeated upon the other. Andy Bannister does a great job of under helping you understand this. This supports now what happened, but this did not happen at the time of Abu Bakr or Uthman never happened at Uthman, this all begins to happen after 833, after Ibn Hisham. Let's go to the next uh, category, the 741 AD inscription. Now, this I, was I did on September the 18th, a video I did on this. This is this one really blew my mind, because remember, Hattun, I've always talked about the first reference to Mecca is 741, right? The inscription of the uh, Methodius uh, Byz Byzantia. I've always talked about that, that that is the first time that we've ever looked at, the, that, that anybody heard about the name Mecca. The problem was I didn't read the rest of the inscription. And Mel says, Jay, you haven't looked at everything. You need to look at the rest of the inscription. Look and see what he says next. Yes, he does refer to Mecca. But is it the Mecca of the Hijaz? No, 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 no. Let's just call it the Byzantine Arabic Chronicle because I don't want to get into the whole name of it. That was written in 741. And the Abdul Mele, Abdul Malik, according, that's the way they said Abdul Malik, assuming the epics of the kingdom, ruled for 20 years. In the first year of his rule, he directed all the experience in virtue of the mind of his great uh, army against Habdallah, Abdullah al Zubair, whom his father had attacked so many times in various ways, all the way finally to Mecca, as they considered it the home of Abraham, which lies in the desert between Ur of the Chaldeans and Kara, the city of Mesopotamia. Now, in the 8th century, they, they would have thought that Ur is in up north in Edessa, in southern Turkey, in your country, Hatun. That was where Ur always used to exist. That's traditionally where everybody thought Ur of Chaldees, where Abraham came from. Today we know better because in uh, 1853, a British uh, risk scholar uh, or scientist <coughs> or adventurer named J.E. Taylor discovered Ur and found it to be in Iraq. But that was 1853 that he discovered it. So the people then assumed it was near Edessa, and they always thought it was near Edessa up in what is today southern Turkey, just south and between Edessa and Haram, the towns of Abraham's brother. Let's look at the map, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So the Ur that they, this inscription is talking about, the Mecca that it's referring to, is right between Ur and Haram. There, look at the right right-hand side of the map, the right-hand map. Look over in the, mod, the the colorful one in the middle. That is today called Shan Hurfa. Am I pronouncing that correct? Shan Hurfa. That's your country. Yeah, Shan Hurfa. That was the original Mecca. That was the Mecca of the 741 Chronicle. And you can see on the left map, the white map, you can see where it is in Turkey. It's in very close to the the Syrian border. So it's very close. It's right up there in southern Turkey today. San Hurfa, as she pronounces it. That's the Mecca, right halfway between Ur and Haram, Edessa. I, we don't have time to get into why the significance. Look at the video. Mel does a great job of going through why they chose it, why that was chosen there, and why Mecca was referred to. Go to the next slide. When you go to the next slide, you notice that that Mecca, that Ur, look and see where the modern day Ur is. I'm sorry. Not, that Mecca up in the north, it's exactly south. When they, the Abbas, Abbasids, relocated the Kaaba further south, they built it directly south of the old Mecca. The new Mecca would have the Kaaba and be the place that the Qiblas began to be directed towards. Now can you see how all the Qiblas are misdirected? 
they're not at all to, to the Qibla that we have today. They were all directed to another Qibla, but that's for another story for another time. We're not going to get into that tonight. The next slide. And this is kind of a sad story. In six, uh, uh, see that inscription that you see pictured there? That's a well-known inscription, and it has dated on it 698, 7 to 698. The inscription was written, this was written in the year the Masjid al-Haram was built in the 78th year. 78th year would put it from 622. So from 622, 78th year would be around 629 to 698, because this is the lunar calendar. Now, what is fascinating, the Masjid al-Haram is, is where the Kaaba, that's the name for the Kaaba. It means the place, the forbidden place of bowing. If we can assume that this inscription, which is located 75 kilometers from Mecca on the route to Ta'if, refers to the site of the Masjid al-Haram, which later became Mecca in the Hejaz, then this would be interesting as it is directly due south of the old Mecca in Mesopotamia. Looks like that inscription. Again, this is the late 7th century. That inscription shows us where the original Masjid, where the second Masjid al-Haram is. Now, interestingly, that picture that you see there, you won't see anymore because that rock inscription was just destroyed last year. Why did they destroy it? Because we now have the evidence uh, it, on that inscription, which is, un which is sad that they have to do that. Come down to the next slide. Notice the sequence. In 697, the 697 inscription near Taif, that's where that inscription is, near Taif, just southwest, southeast of what is today Mecca, indicates the building called Al-Masjid Al-Haram. This is close to the place that later became known as Mecca, or the Indian Hijaz, but it was not yet called Mecca. No reference to Mecca there. It's called the Masjid al-Haram. In 741, the first Mecca was still located just below Ur, or in Edessa, in southern Turkey, the birthplace supposedly of Abraham. In 754, the Masjid al-Haram, the Kaaba, and the Qibla direction in Mecca number two are all fused, conflated together at the site of Mecca in the Hijaz, in what is today Mecca and Medina, in the central part of Arabia, under the direction of al-Mansur, who ruled from 754 to 775, who did the major reconstruction in that year. Therefore, the conclusion, the original Mecca was located in southern Turkey in Urda, which is south of Tadessa. Note, it is much too far north once again, but directly above the present-day second Mecca. Come on down to the next slide. So, Petra versus Mecca. So people are saying, well, hold on a minute. How can we have this Mecca way up there? And what about Petra here? Let's go and see. Let's uh, break this through so people can understand it. Next slide. Let's remind ourselves of Petra, Jordan versus Iraq. Are we getting two conflicting or two complementary and sequential scenarios? Iraq concerns politics, the Quran, and the theological debates. Petra in Jordan concerns really only the Qiblas, the direction of prayer in mosques. Iraq both precedes Petra and returns following Petra. Iraq is important between 5, 575, 577 to 636. That's the, what we're looking at right now. We're looking at it because it is the earliest part. It looks like all of this happened in that area in, uh, uh, in the 6th uh, and the 7th century. Petra becomes important between 626 to 727. So Petra, with all the mosques, are now pointing towards Pekka, uh, Petra up until 706. And then the first, the first Mecca, uh, uh, Kibla does doesn't be is not introduced till 727 it becomes important in that era then we go back to Iraq again Iraq then becomes important again from 736 onward because of the Qurans and the Qirats so let's look at Petra versus Mecca the one preceding the other next slide the need for a place was already in place Petra has all the stations of the pilgrimage which are now in Mecca a square there, Kaaba, with the exact dimensions mentioned by Azraki, which do not fit the present day Kaaba. It has the Safa and Marwa mountains. It has real mountains, unlike the two that are there in Mecca today, which are nothing more than little rocks 15 feet high. They're nothing more than facsimiles of the real Safa and Marwa, which are in Petra. It has the washing of water with cisterns and waterways, everything you would expect to have, as the, as the traditions say. That's in Petra. That is not in Zum, it is not in Mecca, which only has the Zumzum well. It also has the 
plain of Muzdalafa, a slippery slope mountain with a mosque and a church at the top, and where easily 5,000 people could pray. Again, this is all found in Petra, and it has the Jamara platform with the pillar to throw 49 or 72 rocks. It's also found in Petra, not the three platforms which are now in Mecca, suggesting three devils. So in almost every case, Petra fits the whole pilgrimage, uh, the whole pilgrimage sequences, the five sequences. Go to the next slide. Traditions tell us that Mecca is in a valley, yet Mecca is not, while Petra is. The Thanea cliffs are not in Mecca, but they can be found extensively in Petra. The Quranic god Allah and the goddess Allah and Aluza are uniquely from Petra, not Mecca. All the stations on the pilgrimage referred to in the earliest texts are found in Petra. In fact, everything the Quran and the traditions speak of can be found in Petra and are more realistic and more historical. Let's take a look at a map and see what I'm talking about. When you look at a map, uh, number four, 114, notice where Petra is. Petra is the ancient sanctuary city of tombs and temples. It is on the trade route both east, south, west, no, did I say south? No, it is not. There's nothing going south there. It's all east, west, and north. Now that's usually, why hasn't anybody noticed that before? Mecca is not on any international trade route because of the Red Sea and its west. You can see where the Red Sea trade route goes up. That's what Patricia Corona found. Petra is where the Nabataean Aramaic was spoken and written, which later gave birth to the Quranic Arabic. Petra is where all the mosques up to 706 are facing, even as far away as Canton in China and Charman in India. Therefore, conclusion, Petra seems to have been the original Mecca. Note Petra is much too far north. Now, not the word Mecca, not the name Mecca. It's the original sanctuary. Petra is much too far north to support the later tradition once again. Let's go to our conclusions. Now we're going to bring it all together. Because I know I've been going really fast. So I didn't want to sit there because we're running out of time. We only have 15 minutes to go. So let's go to the conclusions. And let's look at the first one, uh, number 116. And here we're going to see why everything seems to be too far north. Next slide, 116. Northern dominance. Take a look at those red dots. Look at those two green dots. Mecca and Medina have no manuscripts. The North has six to nine manuscripts. Mecca and Medina have only eight kiraats. The North has 22 kiraats. Mecca and Medina, no canonical Quran, whereas the North gave us the final Hafs Quran. Mecca and Medina uh, have no Qiblas until 727. The North has all the Qiblas up until 706, all facing Petra. Mecca Medina have the wrong Muhammad. The North has, now has the right Muhammad. His name was Ilyas ibn Kabisa. Mecca Medina have no rock inscriptions. The North have all the rock inscriptions, and they are pre, they are pre-Islamic. Mecca Medina no hijra. The North created the original hijra in 622. Mecca Medina gave us the second Mecca. The North gave us the first Mecca. Mecca Medina, no ancient sanctuary. The North had the original sanctuary. Almost everything we know about Islam today came primarily from the North. No, all of these northern areas except Cairo are where the Abbasids originated from. Next slide. Conclusions. I'm going to go through, I think, uh, I think 18 conclusions. So these are the first nine. The sources for everything we know about traditional Islam come too late and from far too far away. Number two, except for the first canonization, which is impossible to find, the other four canons are, are too far north, Cairo, Damascus, Kufa, and Basra, thus all in Egypt, Syria, or in Iraq. Number three, the Quranic Arabic is derived from Nabataean Aramaic, which is much too far north again. Number four, the Ashtanami letter is not from 7th century, but from the 16th century, thus much too late. Number five, the Constitution of Medina is not from the 7th century, but from the 9th century, again, too late. Number seven, ah, there should be number six, the doctrine of Iacobi refers to the wrong man at the wrong place and from the wrong time. Number seven, Muhammad is not in, in the Quran, nor is he on the inscriptions of the Dome of the Rock, Muhammad the man. Number nine, the coins support the 7th century archaeological and documentary evidence and simultaneously confront the traditional 9th to 10th century Islamic narrative. Next page. Ilyas ibn Kabisa of Tayaye may be the 7th century Muhammad the later traditions borrowed. 
Number 11, we cannot find any of the four rightly guided caliphs in the 7th century at all, which is odd. Number 12, the rock inscriptions prior to 690 say nothing about Islam, nothing about Muhammad, nothing about Mecca, nothing about the Quran or about Muslims. These only begin to appear after 690, according to the inscriptions, and are finally introduced, as we know it, today between 720 and 730. Number 13, the Hijra of 622 was simply a later redaction by the Abbasids onto an earlier battle won by Heraclius for the Arabs, yet recognized as the year the Arabs finally created their own identity. Number 14, the 741 inscription is the first reference to Mecca, yet places it below Edessa in southern Turkey, too far north. Number 15, Petra was the initial sanctuary for the Arabs, which was later replaced by the current Mecca. Conclusion, the historical record suggests that most everything we now know of Islam in the 7th century is either too far north or too far away or too far and much too late to be the Islam of the 9th century Islamic traditions. Final conclusion, Islam is nothing more than a later Abbasid creation. And the last slide. Yet casting doubt on Muhammad, our Muslim friends can consider a better man, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I have a, a poem that I would like to read. I wrote this last night. Okay. Quickly wrote it together. It's, I think, um, well, it's a few strips. You could sing it. I could sing it to supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, but I don't want to sing. My voice is almost gone. So let me just go ahead. And this is my birthday gift to Muhammad. Okay? Okay. Why are you now going I said, to tell us why are you going to give that one? Because I refuse to mock him. I refuse to mock anybody. You know me. I don't mock. But I do want to show you how you can talk about him from... Uh, in fact, this whole poem is actually a review of everything we've just done. OK, mm -hmm. so in some ways it should be at the end of this talk. So okay. let me go ahead and give you this poem. Yeah, just, on, just remember, Mohammed didn't like poets. Oh, well, go all the, even more so then. Asma bin Marwa. OK, but Ilyas ibn Kadisha loved poetry. He was a king. OK, let's, I'm, let's I'm, go for it. So this is to the real Mohammed, the Ibn uh, Ilyas ibn al Kadisha. We all know well Muhammad's name. He's been around a while. He lived in Mecca, so we're told his prophethood's on file. Yet no one saw him face to face, nor heard him speak a word. And all we know is centuries old, and that's downright absurd. Hisham, who wrote his story down, lived two centuries too late. Buhari, who wrote what he said, lived at a later date. There was just nothing written down they borrowed from hearsay and lived in towns way far to north, hundreds of miles away. And so it seems uh, it's all made up by Abbasids, we are told, who sought to purge all previous views and introduce their mold. They needed an identity different from those before. They had no book. They had no man. They needed something more. Muhammad was the name they chose and Mecca was his town. The Quran was his special book, each word in letter sound. Yet that which they say came from God was written down by men who lived in Iraq far to north, not even from his ken. The final version they call Hafs was not one of the best. He lied and cheated all the time, much worse than all the rest. The Arabic which, he, the Arabic which it contained, from Hijaz it was thought, its grammar letters just weren't right, especially without dots. So where did it originate? Where could it have come forth? Southern Levant is where it hails, again, too far too north. The mosque became their focal point. The Qiblas were confused. When Gibson found they pointed north, he was indeed bemused. Yet what about Muhammad's name? It's nowhere to be found. His, the Hijaz is the place he walked, yet nothing's on the ground. The rock inscriptions are all blank. You'd think they'd say much more. Of him, we cannot find a trace. He's really just folklore. The coins are equally opaque. Of him, there's not a peep. Perhaps they went on holiday or maybe fell asleep. His town, Mecca, where he grew up and where he sought his fate, was not known until 741, 100 years too late. 
Many have said he wrote letters and sent them all abroad. The Ashtanami is one case, but it has proved a fraud. The Medin, the Medinin constitution supposedly is true, but it makes too many mistakes. Its truths are all too few. The Doctrina Iokobi is also claimed as true, but their man in Jerusalem turns out to be a Jew. Muhammad did not really live. His story is a lie. No one can find him anywhere, no matter how they try. So what should be our final say on who Muhammad was? He never lived. He never died. That should give us a pause. Without Muhammad, Islam dies. It flits and floats away. Since we now know he didn't exist, Islam has had its day. But wait, hold on. Don't fret. Don't cry. We have a solution. Our Lord Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can give you salvation. He died upon the cross for you. You don't need now to roam. He waits for you with outstretched hands. Why don't you just come home? That was very good, Jay. That's well my done. little ditty for Muhammad for today. I didn't know you could write poems. Oh, I write poems all the time. Just those kind. Well they're done. quiche. They're simplistic, but they're fun. Well done. Um, thank you very much, Jay. Um, that was helpful. I think uh, people need to rewatch it stuff. But let me just get rid of everything from my screen. And then see if there is any question I can bring it to you from the chat. Um, I need to make sure if I see the chat clearly because I need to make chat big. If you can see the chat, if there is any question. I can see it says come home to Christ, Muslims. Yeah, there is no any What a beautiful way. birthday gift. I'm not sure if he deserves it, but uh, poems are nice. Well... Ilyas Ibn Kabisa is my Muhammad. You can keep the one that, from the traditions. I want nothing to do with him. I've just run out of time and patience for that man. I want this guy in the seventh century. He makes a lot more sense. And that's why it makes my job so easy. I don't have to really pay attention to him anymore. The only difficulty, I know a lot of people like to use a lot of the material from the seventh century to confront and blast Muhammad. But I don't see anybody asking that question. That usually comes up whenever this comes out. Okay, um, I can't see any questions. Okay. okay, there's no questions. I guess people that, are out of questions. I think we've uh, introduced an awful lot of new material yeah. tonight, and that's unfortunate. Uh, um, you can All of this you can go up on Fander Films. It's all there. It's broken up into much more manageable sound bites than what I did tonight. Tonight I only had three hours, and I threw everything at you in three hours. And as you noticed, I had to speed up towards the end. To get it all. Uh, you, you did very very good job Jay and maybe there were questions I am sorry if you did ask questions because I was sharing screen from both sides I you did not get my attention but uh, you can always put them in the chat and then hopefully we will look at them or as Jay mentioned the video is in his talk which he made you can simply rewatch those videos and then see if your question still stands drop us email and we can have Jay again to barbecue him ask, ask your questions <laughs> barbecue me you like just ask the questions uh, uh, get the answers ask the questions and get the answer okay nothing, nothing wrong with god that. bless you nothing I just love how, listen am i your, am i still on your killing list uh yes you are but um i'll ask practical question for you i've got 10 minutes uh, like 15 minutes but it will be good to have the Five minutes to get coffee. Before hey, listen, I, I sped it up so I could get done by quarter after. I did you a favor. You said you had to finish this down. You said you had to really shut us down by quarter after. I'm right on the dot. So I got, well I did done. my job. Well done. I just, it will be good to just have a time for coffee. But anyway, I'll ask you a practical question. Um, I don't know if you followed, uh, if you checked the news or not, but um, three beloved ones, three um, Christians were killed in France um, yeah. today. Your no. thoughts? Well, they were killed for the very same thing that you were slapped with on Sunday. In some ways, you have to be very careful, Hatun, okay. because um, there is a let's rising... Just let's just focus on the um, France fire. You asked me my answer. I'm going to give yeah. you my answer. You may not like it. Okay, but I think there's a, the, there is a backlash the... against Islam right now. Remember, yeah. this 
this whole trial of Charlie Hebdo is ongoing in France at the moment. The the young 16 year old who who killed the 47 year old teacher a week and a half ago or two weeks now that has been all over France and they're shutting down in France. Finally, Macron is finally doing what he should have done years ago, and he's not allowing anybody to support that 16 year old. As a result, Muslims are rising up and now we're starting to see them coming out of the woodwork. And interestingly, they're not attacking atheists. They're not attacking humanists. They're not attacking politicians. They're attacking 70 year old women in churches. The woman that was killed was in her 70s. Why is she such a threat to these Muslims? Why are women such a threat to Muslims when it comes to this? Why are you, Hatu, not even little or five foot two? Why are you such a threat to Muslims? And so I think there's, there's something that Muslims need to, they need to look deep into their heart. Because the Islam that they follow is the Islam of the traditions. This is the traditions that I've been confronting tonight. The Islam of the traditions portrays a Muhammad that does use violence, that did use violence. He did it against the Jews, the Banu Kanemishka, the Banu Nadia, the Banu Kodesh. Remember the first person that that wrote poetic verse against Muhammad. No, probably no different than what I just did right now. Asma bin Marwan was a woman. And what did he have, have uh, his disciple do? To go there in the middle of the night. She was suckling her baby. She had six babies on the bed and she stabbed her through the heart, came back the next morning, told Muhammad what he had done. And Muhammad said, blessed are you for what you have done to my prophet to what you have done for your prophet. That is the model of the traditional Islam. That is the model of the Islam of Ibn Isham al-Wakiri. That's the Islam. That's the Muhammad of al-Buhari. That's the Islam that Muslims follow today. 99.9% .9 of all Muslims follow that Islam, that Muhammad, that man, that example. I want nothing to do with him. And I hope Muslims who are watching and listening, listen, you can sit there and wring your hands and say, this is not us, this is not us. It is exactly you. If you send a man to kill a, a poetess who wrote poetic verse, that's all she did. She was from Medina. He wasn't from Medina. He was the guest. She was not. He had only been there only a few months and he had her killed. If that is your model, if that is your paradigm, then I would suggest that you leave that model. Leave that model right now. Have nothing to do with him and come on home. Come on home to Jesus Christ. What a man for you. What a model for you. What a guide for you. What a God for you. Because he is the perfect model because he is God himself. And you can't get any better model than that. And that model, that man, that God, he died for you. And that's why it's the, he, we don't, he doesn't ask us to kill anybody at any time for anyone. My God, my Jesus, never asked anybody to kill somebody who was writing poetic voice against me or who was creating and putting up cartoons. My God never does that. My God has already died for us. My God says to put away your sword, for he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Matthew 26, verse 52. My God would not even let the disciples defend him. That's my God. What a God. What a man. What a God for today. What a God for every day. What a God for you and what a God for me. So I would suggest if you're going to look at a model that you want to follow, if you want to look at a model that is as applicable today as it was in the first century, it is it's just as applicable in the 21st century and will be as applicable from here on out, then come back to Jesus Christ. He does not let us kill women in churches or in mosques or anywhere. He does not let us defend him. He doesn't need defense. That's why we allow you to mock him. We allow you to ridicule him. We allow you to criticize him. We allow you to do anything you want. You can mock Jesus all you want. We will not touch you because Jesus stands all your mockery. Jesus stands up and is able to take all your criticism. He has for 2000 years. Unfortunately, your prophet is not able to. It's obvious to me now that your prophet is so weak that you have to kill others to shut down any critique. Come on home. His name is Jesus Christ, and we offer to him to you tonight. Thank you very much for that, Jay. I've been, I've been reflecting on um, Jesus's attitude towards um, individuals as while eternal Son of God steps into the world, walks mm -hmm. among people, gives himself for them, the, the individuals who put like nail on his hand as he was getting they were putting him upon the cross as they hit the nails on his feet or who, those people who tied his hands up heart of eternal son of god is so amazing he would simply mm -hmm. 
open his arms with the like holes in his hand and then still embrace those people if they repent or when they repent and then he will say the blood which you put the nail went through from my my hands that blood i am sh shedding i'm giving up that blood for you yeah yeah uh, his heart is like so amazing and all all needs to be all needs to be done is just looking at how beautiful how delightful he is and from that there is something in like once you know when you meet with people who just like met with someone and then they say I, I hope that similar thing happened to you when you were before you got married they meet with someone and then they say without her or without him life wouldn't be the same I don't mm. want to live without that it is the same like once you see the heart eternal son of God gives you or donates you through his death and his resurrection you don't want to you don't want to walk away from that. You, you, like your life wouldn't be life without that donated heart. Yeah. And I guess the purpose of all, as we are looking at Muhammad this week, uh, because Muslims are celebrating his birthday. Uh, bottom line is, if you if we look at from the historical side or traditional side, traditional side is seems to be very dangerous when it kind of comes into application historical side is like so messed up now he end up somewhere somewhere in um not uh south of turkey with a different name with a different location with a different time <laughs> and your historical muhammad or traditional muhammad as jay said he is not going to help you to get to heaven he is not going to help you to get to god all he is going to help you to make your way to hell as quick as you can. That's all traditional or historical Muhammad offers to mankind. It is only Lord Jesus Christ who offers himself, who offers triune God, and he offers place for us in the bosom of the Father. Why? Because God did not step back. He stepped into the world, lived among us, and give himself for us that is the god we want you to worship there is no any other way there is no any other alternative because our god is so gorgeous so delightful yeah and with that in note i've got only two minutes to get go and get coffee <laughs> before i go to my meeting jay thank you very much for um being available for us and helping us to think through a um, historical side of islam uh, which is like very practical thing, very practical questions we can always ask our Muslim friends in the intention they think through and then they walk through the bridge Lord Jesus Christ built for them. And of course, thank you very much for amazing poem. I think we will ask you to share that poem with us because that's the summary of all that three hours. That will make our life easier. <laughs> and of course, um, Thank you everyone who joined us in the chat and who stayed until following day. It's two, nearly 2.30 in UK. I don't know what time is it over there, Jay? What time is it over there? 10.30 in the evening. It's not It's not very late for us. Okay, yeah. Jay, but listen, Jay, bless you, like Hatu, for all now. that you're doing. Bless you for staying up so late. Thank you for this great, uh, this great uh, marathon that you're putting on. You've done six hours yesterday. You've done six hours today. You did six hours the day before. You're doing more than six hours today. God bless you for your tenacity. And I don't know where you get all that uh, that energy to keep going. Well done. Oh, it's been fun I, I, being I with have you. Got, we'll do it I've again. got I've got God. I don't have anyone else. Uh, so, uh, beloved ones, we will see you tomorrow for um, Mohammed's birthday open Skype. Uh, if you are going to call in, please make sure you bring a birthday present for him. And dear Muslims who are going to watch this or who have been watching this, we love you to repent and worship the eternal son of God. There is no any other way. There is no better way. And... That needs to happen soon because life is getting shorter. 
uh, mm-hmm. beloved ones may our re- crucified and risen Lord silent you with his love we will see you tomorrow evening thank you very much Jay God bless you bye bye